Comrades, welcome to episode 12 of the Quanfi Show. As you can see, we have a guest. We have Greg Lunt on the show today. Um, my voice is kind of fucked. I'm going to do my best to not clear my throat on the mic too many times, um, but please bear with me. Um, for tonight, we're going to talk about the new website that's coming up for Quant Network. Um, we're going to have a look at the Financial Times. Gilbert spoke there last week. Greg attended and... Um, we're going to have a stab at what is said uh, by both Gilbert and Thomas Arjano. Um, and of course, Greg Lund is here. And um, he's a well-known community member, does a lot of work on the Twitter, um, does Twitter spaces, hosts clubhouses, um, makes monster threads, the ODAP thread we uh, we um, we addressed last episode. It yep, uh, was obviously do. made by him. There goes a lot of work into doing that. So we're going to pick his brain, what his, uh, his routines are, and uh, what makes him tick in a way. So, uh, Greg, thanks for being on the show, man. How yeah, are you? Happy to be here, guys. Thanks for having me. Uh, big fan of the show. And, uh, you know, I'm just happy to be here and share and uh, have a little conversation about Quant. Amazing. Yeah. Really looking forward to uh, today. Yeah, it's uh, it's been an exciting week. I think, uh, you know, what was your perception of last week? <clears throat> My perception of last week, um, it's a full week, at least. We had the, the Dutch episode, we had two guests there. Uh, we went like balls deep into the tech of, of ODAP and Bordergate yeah. Protocol, inspired also uh, by, uh, by, uh, by by Greg. Um, we had so, Nils, yeah. uh, Nils on the show, and that man is, um, he's an animal when it comes to, to infrastructure and everything that has to do with that. So he actually literally melted my brain and Tim's on that episode. Yeah. It was, it was pretty interesting. Um, and it was King's Day yesterday in the Netherlands, which is like uh, a holiday where we cel celebrate the monarchy, celebrate the king. Mm -hmm. And that's always a good excuse for drinking a lot of, uh, well, drinks. Booze. Yeah. yeah. And, uh... Having other substances. Yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't yeah. do that, but um, yeah, a lot of people were kind of, uh, what's the word? having a hangover today yeah but and, I, I i didn't <laughs> yeah and, and and all the quantanta things it's um probably business as usual um yep. expecting an update actually today two to five um usually it's there we'll see yep. <laughs> and um price action sucks everybody's crying everybody's bitching um tomorrow by the way we're gonna have um a twitter no, space today today oh I'm yeah today yeah you. friday yeah. definitely yeah. yeah we record this on thursday i keep yeah. fucking it up <laughs> um so we're going to be on a panel with greg hungarian dr puppers uh, obviously quant for show continue will be there and um we're gonna do uh, a q a not an ama there was some confusion on uh, if there will be a team member present on the ama and uh people were kind of offended or pissed off uh, because it was, uh, uh, how do you say that? Falsified information, uh, false pretenses. False like advertising. That. False advertising, that's it, yeah. Are we fake news? <laughs> yeah, hilarious. Spreading fake oh. news, yeah. It's more of a AUA. It's like an ask us anything. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. So so that's going to be amazing. Also psyched for that. But it's, it's a busy week for us on the, yeah. Yeah, on our on, side, on, yeah. On the interwebs. Yeah, exactly. how, how was your uh, your week, Tim? Um, that's good, I guess. I mean, the Q and T price action sucks, obviously, but on the other side, um, we are very busy. It's, uh, well, this is the second night we are uh, recording, uh, and, and tomorrow we have another one, so it's going to be really interesting how to see how that goes. Also, just still processing the Dutch episode of, of uh, Wednesday, <laughs> man, that was uh, was very intense. Uh, I still don't really understand what was going on. And I think that's a good thing because I was learning a lot. We, and, we addressed um, the, the OC, uh, OC model, OSI model. I don't know if you're aware of that, uh, Greg, but we, 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 we went through that up and down. And um, that's the uh, TCP IP kind of alternative, right? Yeah, the seven layer model, mm -hmm. and, 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 and which comes first from the copper layer to the application layer and everything in between. Mm -hmm. um, but, but like I said, Nils, Knew, knew everything from from the mechanics of the back end up until the oh that said let's not go into that yeah. again <clears throat> sorry tim 
<laughs> no, no, it's fine. And I think yeah, just in general, I'm doing good. Also, our social media presence is increasing. I asked uh, Nagato to help us a little bit. And he did. He immediately sent out a tweet. And I think our uh, number of followers on Twitter do- more than doubled. <laughs> so yeah. uh, that's a great guy. He always helps us out. And uh, if you're listening, really appreciate it. And uh, now it's time for Greg. How are, how are you? I'm great, man. Um, this was a pretty exciting week for me as well. Uh, just, I guess, dating the last seven days, let's say. Um, Wednesday, I put out the ODAP thread, which did, you know, just it. the reception on that was like fantastic. I couldn't have hoped for anything better. Um, I did pour a lot into that. So it was really rewarding to hear everybody liked it so much. Um, and, you know, I'm not a technical person. So it, I almost gave up on it at one point. I was like, just, I, it was confusing, you know, um, but I, I wrapped my head around it enough that I was able to teach a little bit um, with a lot of help from the Harjano video, uh, that interview that I took a bunch of clips from. So that was Wednesday and then got a lot of good feedback. Thursday, I got a nice little shout out from Dread Bongo, who mm-hmm. made a funny little, uh, you know, picture with me with a cape on and stuff. So that was pretty cool. And got, you know, I probably got like, you know, a few hundred followers from that, which was nice. I and then that. Friday, oh yeah, yeah, it was super cool. And I'm a big fan of Dread. Uh, so he he popped me a follow and I was like, oh, that's dope. And then like five minutes later, he put out this like incredible tweet about me. And I was like, okay, that's awesome. So that was a good day. And then Friday, I didn't think my week could get much better. And then Friday I put out that, uh, that Zuckerberg Gilbert, like little yeah. awkward exchange. And, um, you know, Gilbert commented on it, which was super dope. Yeah. Um, and yeah, that, that went crazy. So I don't know what the numbers on that tweet are now, but like, that's definitely my best performing tweet. Gilbert actually ratioed me on that one. Uh, he got more likes on his response than I did on the, the I'll, original. I'll, I'll, I'll quickly bring that up. Uh, yeah. But if see. you're going to get, if you're going to get, that was it right there. If you're going to get ratioed by somebody, it might as well be Gilbert. Um, so what am I at? 674 likes. And what's he at? Scroll down. He's probably 700, 800 likes. In the metaverse, I think it's going to be fundamentally more interoperable. It's designed in a way to be fundamentally interoperable. You know, obviously, there's more technology now that can make it more interoperable, especially if we can get it to be interoperable. So I think having it be more interoperable is going to be key to making the whole thing so dynamic. <laughs> it, so we got... it, it kills me every time and then yeah. here we have uh gilbert yeah interruptible yes mark completely <laughs> completely going with the joke which was i was thrilled about that um and uh yeah i mean that video if i could just i'll tell you how it kind of came about because that wasn't my intention to make that video it happened like mm-hmm. super organically i um I was just cutting up some stuff from Zuckerberg talking. I knew that he had talked about interoperability on the Facebook connect. And then I knew he had talked about it on the Gary V podcast. Mm -hmm. And I had clipped out all the things from Gary V and I wanted to string them together somehow into a little Twitter video. And I was like, the context of each one, it just didn't really flow. So I was like, what if I just put them like back to back to back and did like a little highlight reel. And then, yeah. but it still had the context around them. And I was like, oh, why don't I just cut it down to like, right when he stops saying, when he says the word interoperable, just cut it right there. So I mm. put those together and then I played it back and it was good. And then afterward, it just, I hadn't edited like the rest of the last clip. And it just was him like awkwardly staring at the camera uh, because the way that the interview was, was a kind of a split screen. So even when Gary was responding, you could still see Mark just sitting there, right? Cause it had both people up the whole time. And I had like cropped out just Mark. So on my screen, I was just watching him like make his little like awkward, you know, lizard people faces. And <laughs> he, uh, I was like, that's so uncomfortable. And I was like, what if there was someone on the other end of that call? And I was, it just popped in my head. I was like, Gilbert. And so I went to the LCX interview and I just, I watched 
basically the whole thing again, or at least I, I would clip to like right when he would, uh, when the other guy was asking questions so that Gilbert was the one just sitting there doing nothing. And I would be like, is he doing anything interesting? So I found, you know, the slow nod. I found the drinking the water. I found, there was one where he like bit his lip, but I didn't end up using it. And so I found a bunch of these clips and I just started stringing them together and messing with it. And it kind of had to be like pixel perfect with the timing and the swallowing and the, the blinking. And you just want to make it like an actual interaction. So I spent, you know, whatever, an hour or two on it. And it was just so much fun. And then I added the music and it just like completed the whole thing. So yeah, the music um, is perfect. It is so. Yeah, it just it really like brings you into like the awkwardness, like you feel yes. like you're sitting on the call. Um, so, yeah, it did great. I was really proud of it. Um, and so that was Friday. And um, I, for, uh, I forget what happened. Something else happened Saturday. Um, but yeah, it was just like bang, 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 bang all week. And um, did a podcast yesterday for Tokenizer's channel. Oh, and, uh, uh, yeah, he also came out of nowhere for me. Uh, yeah. Oh, you know what Saturday was? Just real quick before we get into that. Um, Saturday, you know, I posted in the, the Telegram. And I said, hey, is anyone going to the FT Live uh, or would maybe be willing to like divvy up a ticket? And I got a message from RF and he was like, hey, uh, I'm down to just like throw you half and you can go. And I was like, oh, wow. I was like, that's great. Um, that's a very generous offer. I still am like not super keen on dropping like 150 bucks to go on my end. Um, so like, I'm still a maybe like, unless we can get maybe a couple more people. And he was like, do you care if I like reach out to the community and try to organize like a crowdfunding for your ticket and you can go on our behalf. And like, I was like, if you want to do that, like go for it. Yeah, sure. That sounds great. Um, mm. and so he, he put together the whole thing and, uh, people started contributing and, uh, Yarno, you sent me some money and, uh, dread send a big amount and RF send. And then a bunch of other people, it was probably like eight, nine people probably contributed. And um, it was just like a huge honor. And I felt I was super flattered. And uh, so that was Saturday. It was another good feeling. And then, yeah, I uh, started getting ready for, for that, as well as uh, these other these podcast interviews. So yeah, the one I did yesterday with Tokenizer is coming out today. Uh, so and if you're watching this, it's already out um, on his YouTube channel. Um, and it was great. I did more of a presentation. Like today, we're just going to kind of like kick it and run through some stuff and chat. That was more like I came in and I actually dove deep into the ODAP thread. I dove deep into my network effects thread and uh, broke down some stuff. So it was a little more uh, like I had to do some preparation and present where this is going to be a little more lax. So super excited for, for uh, I was super excited for that. And I'm super excited for this and happy to, you know, just kind of tell people a little bit about myself and instead of just like just seeing the the work um you know just get to like be me for a little bit and kind of talk yeah. to the community and hang out with you guys yeah i th i think it's really interesting tim and i addressed this uh briefly before and we spoke about this um yesterday as well it's um there's kind of the passing on of the baton so to speak within the community like the true o ogs <clears throat> I mean, to be fair, everybody that is in QNT now is is one of, oh, let's say, 40K people, maybe a little bit more. So you're going to be OGs in five years, regardless. But like the the, the, the ICO guys, um, the Lukes and, 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 and the Dreads and, and, and the Ghosts, etc., those guys are taking a little bit more of a back burner, it feels. Mm -hmm. and, and like all these these new guys, us be, being one of them, and you obviously and Tokenizer, actually uh, rising to the occasion now, educating current and, and future holders laying like this very nice knowledge foundation everybody in our own way yeah. um which so which is super amazing but um as, as tim said very uh, very eloquently in the beginning it's um it's 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 just avatars and and text and 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 when, when you add a voice to that it, it gives it even more body and now we, we even have you with, with, with your face on the cat which is super awesome i think um I think we should give a quick shout out as well when we're naming the OGs. The one guy who's been there since day one and is still here providing just as much value is Jeff. Jeff, yeah, uh, definitely. You know, definitely. Jeff yeah. is Jeff is somebody that uh, he's he's very matter of fact in his approach. 
and he is always bringing new articles and ideas and LinkedIn posts and random websites. And it's always um, about the future of finance. Uh, some of it ties into quant, some of it is more just bigger picture, but it, it helps lead and structure the conversation that we all have on the back end that helps yeah. people like me and you guys in yeah. order to create our content. So yeah. And God mode modding on every freaking yeah. channel. He's in Everywhere. there all the time, just making sure he's, you know, he's answering the same questions over and over and over. Um, so yeah, just have a lot of respect for Jeff. And, but yeah, to, to your larger point, like there is that wave that, that uh, I don't want to say influencer, but that uh, like content creator wave um, wave one was kind of those early, like, like you said, the ghosts, the Luke's, the dreads, the Jeff's uh, the AJ's. Yeah. Um, AJ, yeah. we're probably missing a couple as well Definitely, but always um you know Seven. now we have now we have this the sex there you go and so we have uh this new wave now where it's like you guys it's me it's san it's just a tech guy mm. it's it's just tokenizer um it's a lot of folks that are contributing and uh quantidian does a great job in the telegram specifically yes um and so you know, we're, we're, there's going to be another wave and another wave after that. And uh, we're just doing our part. So it's an exciting time. We have the benefit of a lot more hard evidence towards sure. what makes Quan an exciting project. A lot of, I think the wave one guys were, and gals were looking at basically just Gilbert and saying, you know, this is what he's saying in the AMA. I do kind of see some links to the real world and how this makes sense. But there's no Oracle certification. There's no SIA partnership. There's no LAC chain. There's no CBDCs at scale. Like, you know, these links to all these different central banks. Like, we have the, like, if you do the digging, there was no ODAP at all. Like, we are able to dig through a lot of resources that they never had access to. So, True. they did have weekly AMAs, just about. That's nice. <laughs> we spoke about that in the in the in the, in the Dutch uh, podcast, and um, I can remember like 2020, it, there were at least bi-weekly in the beginning. So and and then it started smearing out. So it was once every two weeks, then every four weeks, then six, eight, and well, we know where we are now. Where we're you go, if Gilbert pops in when we get a new exchange. Uh, that's yeah. about it, which is fair. Obviously, it's understandable. Um, but I think if you go back to the really, really early days, so 2018, at the beginning of the year, uh, they, there were almost like daily AMAs. Like Gilbert used to be on Telegram pretty much every day, I think. So it, it, yeah, that really changed. And I'm just thinking about what you just said. And yeah, there are waves, definitely. And well, really, we really now have the benefits of well, kind of using and reusing the stuff that the first wave did. Uh, and, and we have just so much to cover because we need to kind of clarify what the first wave did. They really did the deep research and they are now just so far in that they, they only do dot connecting now and because they already know any, everything. And, and you just see this new wave coming in and trying to explain what happened there. And, and, and we actually have the luxury of also enjoying the benefits of the dot connecting wave one is still doing. So that is, uh, that is that's definitely great. That's 100% true. Like, yeah. the only reason that I was able to get my ODAP thread off the ground was because of sex research. You know exactly. what I mean? Yeah. The only reason that I was able, that I've been able to help understand and mm -hmm. describe the tokenomics is because of sex medium articles. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, SEQ. So, yeah, not SEX. We don't, YouTube, don't ban us. Uh, <laughs> we are already demonetized anyways, because <laughs> Yarno will throw in some stuff later. This <laughs> I think, I think if we, if we use this wave theory, I'm always thinking about technical analysis when I use that, but uh, I think like the third wave will inevitably be like the more general influencers again. They've been here. Uh, they, they always come and enter the chat for some time when, when we are bullish. And then they leave the chat again. I mean, sure, some some of them are true supporters of QNT. They will always support us. But I think the third wave will be the influencers. So the people picking up our stuff and bringing that to their audiences. I think that will inevitably happen. Uh, but we are just in between. We're just riding a bear market at the moment, I think. Can we call it a bear market? It's That's We're true. bearish. You know, it's yeah. hard to, to label what is a bear market. Speak for uh, yourself. But... I'm not bearish. 
No, no, but the the price action is bearish. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, we are not bearish. Uh, no, 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 definitely. But not. you know, you know what they say is that you ba- you build in the bear market, exactly. and what no. we're doing is personally we're building our audiences and our channels and our content, uh, yeah. and we're also building, helping build a strong, really strong community. I mean, this community is extremely impressive, and I don't just say that like. The people are very dedicated. They're very smart. They're very hungry for knowledge. I just tweeted about this yesterday. Like you guys are here for the memes you, or you enjoy and you love and support the memes, but really you're here for the deep research and the fundamental yeah. analysis. And yeah. what I've seen over the past nine months since we started to decline in price has the community gotten, it's gotten even more tight knit and it's gotten even stronger. The fundamental research has taken a step up and when the next wave of people come in, whether that's content creators or just investors, uh, you know, there's going to be a huge surge and we're already going to have this incredible solid base, not just in content, but in community for people to come in and to learn and to be a part of what we've already discovered. Yeah. I wanted to address that, that exact same point. If you look at, and I don't obviously know, obviously don't know how it is in, in other communities, but just like getting you to the event, um, it didn't take 24 hours mm-hmm. to cough up over $300 to get to get you there. And the same with um, w- whenever news comes out, it, it, it takes 24 hours before threads are, are built. And, and there's like this cross-pollination where everybody is like scaffolding and building on top of, of work that, that other people did and crediting them for it. It's very yeah. rare that you see actual plagiarism, I think, within the quant community. There's always an attaboy in a thread or, or, or in, 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 in content. Um, very respectful uh, community, uh, very knowledgeable, like you said. I also find the, the, the Telegram groups um, very well moderated, but also very well behaved. Yep. There, there, there's very little shilling and garbage, and it's all pretty, pretty on point. Um, it's a really nice place to be. Yeah. <laughs> it, it really is. No, and, and it's also impressive how we are present on all platforms. So, Paul, personally, I took the, I filled the gap on Instagram because there was no Q and T presence, or there was, but it were just some fake accounts or something. So we just started building a brand there, and that really worked out. Now on YouTube, uh, there is an increasing presence of YouTubers now covering quants consistently. Sure, on Twitter, it, it's always been the, the case that we were there, but I think the, the Twitter presence is only increasing people linking to each other and then saying what you, do, what you just said. And Telegram has always been our main place, and it's so well moderated. Some people call it an echo chamber. Uh, that's probably true. Uh, but also just the amount of Q&T groups. Uh, it, it really baffles me how much Q&T groups there are. And there are also Q&T related groups, which discuss other to- coins and tokens and it's still about Q&T because we still all believe in it but you can freely discuss it's so well done yeah. I think the only platform we're not really present on is, is, is Discord I think I'm not sure if there's a great Discord community not uh, yet no and, and we are also on Reddit but I think the Reddit moderators don't really like Q&T at least in the crypto uh, general crypto feeds but not there yet. is a quant community Reddit, so that's great. Yeah, yeah. It's just Dread, Dread has been uh, no, not Dread. Uh, Kapopris is a little bit of a of a Reddit uh, guy, mm. um, <clears throat> but Reddit is 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 is, is very. Um, let, let, let's not go there. But <laughs> but no, man. The the, the Twitter game is, um, is is getting better and better. I think the everything, the posts are getting much higher quality, and 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 a lot of it is thanks to you. Um, so, so what I actually want to know is let, let's 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 show people. I'm going to share my screen. <clears throat> May I add one thing before you continue? And I think it's also the, the or force really that we have people with different backgrounds, so not necessarily being very good in doing the fundamental research. But for example, with Instagram, we have a literal graphic designer who's helping us making those posts. How incredible is that? You, you literally see people helping each other getting those graphics right doing the editing, uh, making those videos. It's amazing how everyone is helping and contributing. Sorry, back to uh, what you just uh, wanted to share. Yeah, 
Yeah. And, and what was interesting when I, when I was doing my, uh, trying to do my due diligence to, uh, to get up some tweets and uh, to, to immerse myself a little bit in, in everything that Greg created, um, I went back to the, to the very beginning and it was in January, February. And it, it seemed like you just popped into existence then and you just blasted off with clubhouses and, 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 and with interviews right off the bat. And, and I, I couldn't find any history of you b- before, say, January or February. Can you elaborate on that a bit? Yeah, the truth is that I didn't actually exist before January of 2022. Uh, so this is, yeah, I, uh, I spawned from Zuckerberg's lair and I, I came here it. to shill Quant on behalf <laughs> of the Facebook uh meta the, the yeah. facebook illuminati yeah so yeah. um yeah man look i've been in quant since uh october 2020 um but i didn't start creating you know i started uh like friends and family groups where i would be sharing a lot of the links from the telegram and doing like like long form kind of you know not presentations but just explanations about like how it's all tied together And I was like, I was also simultaneously building a clubhouse audience, talking about crypto in general, um, helping people onboard into hardware wallets and what is Bitcoin and what are altcoins and a lot of like newbie stuff. Um, I, I'm not but, aware with, with, with Clubhouse. I'm sorry for interrupting. Can you elaborate a bit on what Clubhouse actually is? Yeah, yeah, is? I should do that. Um, so mm. if you're familiar with Twitter spaces and kind of what that experience is like, where you have... Uh, people on stage talking, and then you have people in the audience listening that can raise their hand to join the stage. They literally copied that from Clubhouse, but Clubhouse is its own app. So Clubhouse came out in early 2020 as the first social audio app to get any sort of traction. And then the same way that uh, Instagram took looping video from Vine, the same way that Instagram took stories from Snapchat, uh, Twitter took social audio rooms from Clubhouse, and it's basically the same product. Um, So just think of a uh, an isolated app that's basically just Twitter spaces and it has its own little ecosystem. Uh, there is a crypto community there. There's a lot of Bitcoin maxis on there, but there's also a lot of people that ah. are into crypto in general. Um, there's now a lot of NFT conversations that go on there. There's a bunch of DGen stuff. Like I've heard a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of the yield farming stuff comes up there first. Like people were staking on time and stuff from wonderland making bank for months before it even like crossed over and started to get a little traction. So there's a lot of alpha on there, to be honest, if you have your ear to the ground. And I was like, look, I, you know, I started to shill quant a little bit in some of the rooms when people be like, Oh, what's your favorite coin? What's your favorite coin? Let's all go around the room. Um, and people were kind of interested. And I was like, you know, these few minutes of talking, I'll do a two, three minute spiel is great, but like, there's so much here. And I need to do like a proper presentation on this. So uh, I had built my following up to around like at the time, maybe like five, 6,000 people. And I was like, okay, I'm going to host a room on this date and I'm going to do a full on presentation on this. And I clipped audio clippings from different interviews. And I had, I went through everything that I sat down. It took me probably like two and a half weeks every day of working on. Um, and, you know, it was just a lot of work because I needed to wrap my own head around everything. It was, you know, what is Quant? What is Overledger? What are the partnerships? Uh, who's Gilbert? What is ISO 2307? Uh, just going through everything and every partnership that was confirmed um, and backing it up with evidence and audio clips and changing my, my little avatar as I was speaking, because you can't, at the time, you couldn't put like pinned links at the top. You could only change your profile picture. That was how people communicated visually. So I would be, I was switching out my picture, everyone refresh. Like it was very interactive. Um, and it was just a sick presentation. And it's all on my, on gregluntclub It's still there, uh, that very first one in September. And I got incredible feedback from it. It went about 90 minutes. And then we did like a 90 minute Q&A after. And I was like, I need to keep doing these. So I kept pumping them out um, about once a month on average um, until, uh, well, I guess when the new year came, I actually got hit up by Max Basenko, mm-hmm. who had come from a traditional finance background. He had about maybe 12,000 followers or so on Twitter, uh, all like TradFi and kind of uh, equities. Mm-hmm. And he came and somehow he discovered Quant and came in and he DM me and a few other people and said, hey, let's do Twitter spaces and let's talk about quant and introduce it to some of these traditional investors. 
And it was me, Jeff, Ghost, and Hungarian that ended up uh, joining his first Twitter spaces. Uh, and we did a couple of those. And then we interviewed Santiago Velez as well. Uh, and that is the first post that you see on my Twitter there because I wasn't really posting to Twitter, but I was like, you know what? Now that I'm doing these Twitter spaces and stuff, like I should probably make my profile like proper. Uh, I've been on, if you look at my profile, I've had a Twitter account since 2009. Uh, I so what I, yeah. what I ended up having to do um, was I had probably three, 4,000 tweets and I use, I wanted to just get rid of all of them. I wanted, cause to start fresh, they were all younger me, you know, early twenties, just bitching about like, oh, that guy should have been safe at first base at like a Mets game or something. Just stupid, stupid. Um, so I was like, okay, let me see if I could find something online that wipes all my tweets. And I found something that did most of them, but it only went like 10 years back. So I still had like from like 2011 back. So I had to manually delete like probably 800 tweets over the course of a few days. One day I was just on the phone with someone for 45 minutes and I was just talking to them, just sitting there deleting, deleting, deleting. Um, but yeah, so I cleaned it up and uh, now all you see is Quant starting from the beginning of this year, had about 300 followers in February and I just hit 3,100 today. So it's been a pretty nice rise and I'm just, uh, I'm just super hyped because I feel super aligned with the content. Like I really enjoy creating it. I enjoy pouring into it. And you get that kind of like instant feedback, like the same way if you're like a stand-up comic and you can get on stage and you get that real-time feedback, you get that with posting Twitter and sharing it in Telegram. And the community, like we discussed, is like so kind and so uh, supportive. And so I've been receiving like a ton of good messages and I just want to keep delivering for y'all. So uh, yeah, it's been, a, it's been a blast. Nice, man. Nice, nice, nice. And uh, digesting. <laughs> oh no, no! I'm just wondering how ten year, a ten year younger you was on Twitter. What did we miss? <laughs> yeah, not not anything. I was a lot oh. of like the only interesting stuff I would post would be like stats. So I was yeah. really like when I'd watch sports, I'd see like interesting statistics about like, this is the first guy in 60 years to do this, this, and this. And if you're into that particular sport, but then that was probably like 20 percent of the posts, and the other 80 mm. percent were just like complaining about like that guy shouldn't have got the ball on third down for like a giants game you know football game or whatever so but american football i honestly think that that is also kind of the twitter that we have seen 10 years ago right i think that that was what people were doing there they were just it's, by the way that's still twitter defense. now it's still yeah. twitter now if you're not careful okay. and we've seen so many people like the main right. reason that i did it was we've seen so many people get canceled or not that I had anything that was really cancelable, although I did like, I'd have some like maybe risky jokes on there, I'd say. But um, if I'm going to push myself as, uh, you know, a personality of some kind, or I want people to follow me, I don't want to have any dirty laundry, like sitting back that someone can just go get. Not if it's going to cancel me, but like, even if it's just like, you know what I mean? I just didn't want like garbage out there or like, so uh, I, st but I still think that to your point, a lot of people are still like that. They're, they're not mm. careful because they don't care and you know, they don't put their name to it or whatever it is. And I even find myself sometimes, you know, wanting to respond to the haters or whatever it may be and say some snarky thing. And I'm just like, hey, be professional. Like this is a professional medium. Uh, yeah. So it's a spiritual practice in a weird way as well, you know, to, to be able to recognize your emotions and what's coming up in you and wanting to, it's so easy on Twitter more than any other platform to just fire back and spew negativity and to be able to like harness that or resist that. I think it's awesome. And it's, it's a good practice. Yeah. True. Mm. I'm thinking yeah, of, of go, no, ahead. go ahead, please. No, I'm not sure what you wanted to say. Me neither. Oh, okay. Then I'm, I'm just thinking about saying having dirty laundry all on the internet Reminds me of the, the, the stuff I'm doing in the stories of well, Instagram. And, and sometimes I make these jokes and not everyone understands them. And I'm always thinking, hey, did I do something wrong? And I remember one time there was this one story that I did. And someone asked something about me. I'm, I'm not sure. And I just sat here. Oh, no, I'm just here to dump on the community. Something like that. And it was a clear joke. And then Jarno DM'd me kind of immediately. What did you do? What kind of post is that? It really scolded me and I just took it offline. I was like, okay, okay, it's just a joke. 
Uh, but yeah, you really need to think carefully of what you put on the internet because it will be used against you at some point, even yeah, though it's I all mean, jokes. I, I think something like that, where it's like, you know, it's just sarcasm and it's a joke. Like, even if someone were to screenshot it, it's very easily defensible. Like, you have plenty of reasonable doubt there. It's like, I was clearly joking. And then also the stories, they, they disappear. So like, yeah. the chances of someone screenshotting that and then using it against you and that actually succeeding is probably very slim, where if you have the tweets, they just are right there in plain text forever. So yeah. it's a little, you know, text is a lot harder to, well, I guess your, yours was text also, but yeah, it can be tough sometimes with the text to, to understand tonality and intention. So exactly. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think uh, I, I scolded him most because there are also a lot of non-native English people, and um, Leona, for instance, my uh, my girl, um, her English is okay, but it's not perfect, and she has Instagram. I don't, I don't do Instagram. It's it's not for me. But she, imagine. Yeah, but but she, she every now and then comes up. She's like, okay, what did Tim just post? Read this. <laughs> and I'm like. <laughs> Uh, um, Tim, dude, <laughs> Leona just, uh, <laughs> it, yeah. yeah, it's, it's, it's I, I, I think, it, especially <clears throat> in, in the position that that, that, that we are getting, uh, the three of us, um, you should be very cognizant about how, in how many ways a single message can be interpreted, yeah, and 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 how it can be, um. Well, used is not the right word because then that, then you go into the paranoia kind of things. But I think we want to be clear and concise about what we trying to True. convey. Yeah. Um, hence why I always use voice messages because my typing <laughs> is not only sloppy, it's also, uh, yeah. I tend to go really short through the corners. That's like a little translation from Dutch and I just oh, true. English. Yeah. Um, You're just straightforward. With... Yeah, not very nuanced in writing. No, and, uh, it makes sense. Yeah, it's not ideal. And so I love this long form stuff, man. It's amazing yeah. to have uh, to have you here, Greg. I, I was I was wondering, uh, all your all your threads. What gets into you before you create a thread like that? Yeah, and I know that that sounds really strange, but like what inspires them, kind of. Yeah. Um, well, part one of the best parts about quant and and uh, you know digging into this project is that it becomes a bit of a treasure hunt, and there's a lot of Easter eggs. As I know, you guys had a whole episode titled that, um, mm -hmm. and there's there's just a lot to kind of to discover. And the more you look, the more you find, and the more you piece it together. And it's like this it's this wonderful journey to go on, and we're all still learning so much. And so as things start to flow into the telegram, uh, I used to look at it, every piece I would, that was interesting. And I still do this. I'll mm. take, and I'll put into a notepad and I'll say, okay, that is something that I want to talk about in my next live room. And now what I've done is I take those and I'm like, how could I tweet about that? Is there a piece of media I could take to accompany the tweet? Is there a video on YouTube that I could clip? Is there a screenshot of, um, you know, a government document? Like, how could I, is, is, this, is this a larger thread that I could tie into other ideas and make a real thread out of it? So it's really about just keeping my eyes peeled on Telegram for nuggets of information to come through that are juicy, uh, mm -hmm. particularly ones that can be tied back to existing narratives and existing research. Yeah. And nice. then I just dive, I just dive in and, and, and go for it there's a lot of elements to those threads. So it's, they're fun. They're fun. They're hard work, but they're fun. Yeah. Because we spoke about that, but we had a little bit of an intake a couple of days back and uh, you kind of lifted the curtain a bit on all the different resources you use for, um, for trimming and grooming your tweets. If I said it correctly, you, you told me something about the emoji stuff. Maybe you want to elaborate a bit on that because I found that really interesting because whenever I make a tweet, it just, okay, how many hashtags can I get in there? Does an emoji mm -hmm. fit? And and, 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 and and just send it. You're just but, slamming the keyboard. So. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I, 
I have not ever really like put out a lot of content on Twitter in my life, right? Not anything mm -hmm. that I cared about. And so this is all new for me. Uh, but what I've learned is that you can put a lot into a tweet and you can put a lot into a tweet storm. Um, mm -hmm. You can attach files, you can use GIFs, you can use videos, you can use screenshots, you can use multiple screenshots. You can link out to other stuff. You can embed other people's tweets. You can, uh, you know, and then you have your certain amount of characters that you can use emojis. You can uh, use abbreviations. You so there's a lot. You know, you have to get your writing down, and you have to get your media strategy down. Um, you can take audio files. Now, one thing you can't do on Twitter is can't embed an audio file directly. Uh, but what you can do is you can turn your audio into a video file and then put it in. So. Um, there's a lot of different things that I do depending on the tweet or the thread to make it as engaging and as media rich as I can. Um, the first and foremost, again, is like when I find that nugget, the first thing is like, okay, what media can I take from this? Is it a video? Is it a picture? What is it? Is it audio? So I'll use Photoshop uh, to kind of edit pictures down. So for example, like the Oracle partnership uh, or the Oracle um, certification. If you look at that, that article, like that's not the title of the article and it takes like a few paragraphs to kind of get into the meat of things, but I'm not going to just, I would still rather have the top part that says Oracle blog and then have the part. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll screenshot the whole thing. I'll bring it in. I'll cut out the whole top section. I'll boost it up. So it has the top, you know, I'll clean it up. So it doesn't have like link out to our Twitter and our, or all the Oracle stuff or the, the website navigation. I'll map all that out. So it's clean. And then I'll do the highlighting of the parts I want you to read. I'll maybe add an arrow that points to it, whatever it is, you know, the same with the, um, with like project Yura and project Helvetia, like there's something on page five and something on page 14. One is a paragraph and one is a chart. And I want to put those together for you. And I want to highlight the parts that you want to read. And I want to point to the thing on the chart. And so I'll make those in Photoshop. Um, if it's audio, I basically, uh, if it's like a podcast or something, I'll, I'll rip the MP3 file. Um, and you can do that multiple ways, depending on where it is. Like if it's on YouTube, you can go to like YouTube to MP3. You just type that into Google and they'll have like a bunch of websites you can just paste the link in or YouTube 10 before if I want to take mm. the video, but then sometimes the videos are an hour long and I don't want to download an hour long video. It's going to take me 30 minutes for it to, you know, encode or whatever. So I'll use OBS, which is a streaming and screen recording platform uh, or product that is free. And you can go, it's called OBS studio. And I'll basically just record, I'll play the video and I'll record my screen. I'll take that video for the three minutes of content that I wanted or two minutes, I'll put that into Adobe Premiere. Adobe Premiere is a video editing program. Um, and so then I can chop it up and do all the fun things. Um, I started saying the audio, but didn't get into it, but there's Adobe Audition. So you see, I use the whole like Adobe suite. So Adobe Audition is basically their audio trimming product. Um, and that's the one I've actually spent the most time in over the years because I've done and edited like a couple hundred podcasts. So I'm mm -hmm. used to like kind of taking out the ums and the, the dead air and, or maybe you said something here that would have actually better explained the concept if I put it over here. Uh, maybe you said something in another interview and your mic actually sounded similar. So I'll actually take that in and add. So now like there's something, I have like a minute clip of Gilbert talking about the ODAP, uh, his origins of ODAP and how he started it and everything. That's clipped from like multiple interviews. I've or reorganized everything. The guy actually is very difficult to edit because when you just listen to him speak, he repeats himself a lot. He'll say like the, the, or like, um, um, like he says a lot of like duplicate words. So I have to remove all of those. Like, and then once I get the audio to where I want it to be, I'll add it to the video. Uh, and then I will export that and put it into a website that I found called Veed ved.io and basically what that does is it allows me to automatically subtitle video so that actually saves me quite a bit of time they're not perfect um, i do have to go through and make sure some of the words are spelled correctly or you know the grammar's right uh, i want every single cut to go exactly with the word so i need to double check that the timing is perfect and then when i export that um, there's like a there's like a watermark on it so i have to put that back into premiere and then block out the watermark. Don't tell them I do that. 
um, cause I'm not paying for it. Uh, but you can do that and you can block it out. And then I add like my little outro thing that I made like that little, like robot oh. like follow me, zoom, zoom, Greg Lott, whatever. And then, uh, yeah. So it's kind of like a multi-step process. Um, I was using another Adobe program called Adobe after effects to do like when you have the audio ones and you have the, um, the pulsating, like for every time they speak, it like moves to the MP3. Mm -hmm. I was using Adobe after effects for that, but I actually realized recently that Veed has a simplistic version of that, that can be done just by like drop and drag. So I started using that. Um, I've recently also moved to vertical video instead of doing the horizontal videos for Twitter so that it takes up the full screen when you launch the video from the tweet. So that's all for the media side. And then there's like the tweet itself where I have to like write out my thoughts. And so that's a whole different beast. So the media side is like super fucking fun for me because I just love doing all these different programs and bring it together. And I don't know, it's one of those things they say, like, it doesn't feel like work, you know, when you can get lost, that's, that's it so for amazing. me. That's my thing is like diving into like, um, editing media content. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to the writing, it's always been a little more difficult for me. Dating back to college, I used to, um, you know, I really struggled writing papers. I'd be up all night staring at a blank screen, um, getting super anxious and uh, waking up in the, you know, three hours before class and just banging it out and like just half-assing it. And so writing is always my final product. I'm a good writer, but it's just a struggle uh, to, to, to kind of grind through. With Twitter, it kind of helps a lot because it forces you to automatically outline it's like, this is what I want to cover in this tweet. This is what I'm covering this tweet. This is what I'm covering this tweet. But with the threads, you have to tell a story. You have to, each one has to build off of the last one. They're not isolated. But at the same time, you want them to be in powerful enough where they can be isolated, where someone can retweet that and it can stand on its own. So there's a fine balance there between, uh, you know, telling a, you know, a long story and having individual powerful messages per tweet. So you have to pay attention, obviously, to, to the character count. So I use a website called charactercounttool.com. And it's basically just a text box on a web page and mm. tells you how many characters it is. And you can pump emojis in there. So there's a website called emojipedia.org. And I'm like, <laughs> basically, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, the, the, the emojis add a lot of character to the tweets. Yeah. Um, they say a lot. You know, the picture says a thousand words, right? So yeah. even before I say this next sentence, I can prep your mind for the vibe that I want you to have when reading it or after it to emphasize what I just said yeah. or um, and combining multiple of those. Uh, so if you'll look at my threads, you'll notice that every single tweet has multiple emojis in it because it helps mm. illustrate and and provide a feel and an emotion to what I'm trying to push across in that tweet. Um, I also heard, interestingly, from Naval, who I don't know if you guys follow him at all, but mm. he's, uh, he's just an, he's an investor and an extremely brilliant guy um, talking about, because his tweets go like incredibly viral, every single one. And he said, never put like one slash or like two slash, like don't number your tweets in your threads because then it's so much harder for them to live on their own. So I never number my tweets. I let them all stand alone. Um, but then, yeah, I have like, I basically work at a Microsoft Word and I just have my tweets and I, I put it into character tool and I make sure it's perfect and I paste it back into Word. And then I have all of the things in Word of all the different tweets. Um, a lot of times when I go back and read it, I'll be like, I want to change something, but then I have to bring it back into the character tool to make sure I'm not, you know, fucking it up. And then, uh, and I make a note of what media should be attached to each one. And then I'll copy paste all of that into an email and attach all the media email to myself, get it up on my phone. And then I'll just start pasting it in, into my Twitter drafts. And Twitter's pretty good with the threads where once you get it all loaded in, you can just press tweet all and it just pumps all of them out for the thread at once. Um, and here's a little trick that I've been starting to use that I learned. There's kind of a writing community on Twitter that they basically, they all make money from like just writing and doing copywriting and stuff. And so they pump out a lot of like interesting ideas. And one thing I noticed that they're all doing now is the final tweet of a tweet thread. They'll say, hey, it would also, you know, it'd be, you know, thanks for reading or whatever. It would be really helpful or it would help this thread out if you go back to the first tweet and you like and retweet it. And they'll embed the first tweet in the last tweet so that it's an easy, like just boom. And now I'm back at the top. Yeah. And 
when you're creating and prepping your thread in your Twitter drafts, you can't actually embed the first tweet in the last one because it doesn't exist yet. Yes. So what you have to do is have the text for that on the side in a separate draft or in a notepad on your phone. And then once you press tweet all and your first 10 or 15 go out, you immediately go to the top, grab that, embed it into a new tweet. You can go to the bottom of your tweet storm and it's still, even though it's live, it'll say, add another tweet. You do that, you embed it, you take the text, you put it in, you boom. And now you have your final tweet, which says it would help a lot if you went back to the top. And so that helps. I mean, there's no way for me to, me to really figure out how much that helps, but I can't imagine that it doesn't. Those and calls to action are so, so important. Same with YouTube and all other platforms. If you do not ask people to like, subscribe, and that shit, then people will simply not do it. Not because they're unwilling, but they just don't think about it. They don't think about it. And yeah. I don't feel guilty about it because I know that the content's valuable. So it's like, hey, like, help me share this. Like, I know you yeah. liked it. You made it this far, you know? So, yeah, that's kind of like, uh, there's a lot that goes into it. Um, but it's a lot of fun. And when you finally like piece it together and you, you get it all there and it all comes together and then people respond, there's like nothing more rewarding than that. Nice, man. Yeah. Interesting. And uh, what really resonated with me is what you said about the, the editing and, and, and the treasure hunting first. So it, it's like, like, like going on some kind of epic quest. First, you gather all your materials yeah. and then you're going to start organizing everything. Um, and the editing stuff, I hear you use a lot of uh, Adobe, which is which is super awesome if you have access to all that stuff. Because once you're a little proficient with it, it actually isn't that much work. I can remember for when I edited videos, I, I tried Adobe Premiere and I used Sony Vegas, um, and 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 it's definitely one of those skills that use it or lose it. If, if you it's don't... it's really not that hard. Um, yeah. to get basic, like my dad is 72 years old hmm. and he was, he'd never used a computer before really until like the last 10 years or whatever. And he was just one of those, like, how do I open the browser? Like, I, and now he like cuts videos on like movie maker on his, on his laptop. And it's like, yeah, maybe that specific program is a little simplistic, but it's very easy. It's like, you have a file that you drag in and then you're like, okay, how do I split right here? How do I add like a cut so that it splits it into thing? Okay, I learned that. Now I know that I press R and then click and it does it for like the razor tool. And it's like, okay, how do I make it so they like crossfade? Oh, I just click there. Okay. And it's like, there's YouTube videos, countless, countless YouTube yeah. videos. So it's not for everybody, but like, if you've ever thought like, oh, I wish I could just like, knew how to edit a video or knew how to like use Photoshop. It's like, it's all there for free on YouTube. It's so easy. And it's just, you just play around and make a fun little thing with, for no pressure. Uh, same with audio. It's so straightforward. It's just like, you just cut and clip and cross software is not free. <laughs> the yeah. Well, software. that's what, that's what torrents are for my guy. Yeah. If, yeah, I mean, if what, what does it over for me across now about six, seven hundred euros, something like that? You can, you can pay, I think you can get a subscription to different Adobe products for like 20, 30 bucks a month. Oh, that's um, nice. Oh, obviously, you got that now, yeah. But uh, yeah. yeah, they moved to a subscription, but yeah. yeah, you can, you can also, the internet has uh, got mm. a lot of free, free ways of getting things as well. Yeah. Yeah. The amount of effort you put into those tweets. It's astounding, isn't it? It's really astounding. Yeah. You think of every single detail, and that's impressive. I mean, I'm also well. I've also been posting a lot. Uh, not really that active posting on Instagram at the moment, but I really recognize what you're saying. And, and you first have this thing on Telegram that you see, and you're like, ah, oh, yeah, we should really do some kind of post on this. And then then you, then you start the thinking process of, okay, how are you going to do this? And Obviously, Instagram is a different platform than Telegram, so you just really want the front end to look good, and then you can just put some screenshots so that people go through it and it's easily understandable. But still there, if you want to do a video or something, there's so much that, that you need to think of. Is it rightly edited? Can people view it easily? Is it not, does Instagram not completely screw over the video? So I have all these apps on my phone 
and it, it's the sound okay uh all the all that thinking you need to uh give it subtitles so i also have this app on my phone for that uh, and and just with twitter you think of every single aspect it's so nice it's uh it's impressive it's really it's impressive. A lot. And there's a lot yeah. but like you i mean you obviously understand the grind you're doing the same thing in, in your own way and yeah um the best creators you know it's like the final product seems so simple and straightforward and that's the, yeah. that's the art right is is being able to take all the complexities and just boil it down to something simple and yeah. ultimately at the end of that all you could have the best emojis and the best video editor and what but is what you're actually is the content valuable yeah. so that's that first step right you like you said like making and seeing it in telegram and being like i want to amplify that people will enjoy that they will find value in that and then that's where it all starts yeah but it's getting harder and harder i know this especially on my platform then i really want people to know the fundamentals themselves i think on twitter you can do a bit more speculating i guess for example the telefonica leads you, you can do a bit of um bit more speculation there because the, not all here, here's, are here's an opportunity here's an opportunity for you on instagram yeah. like people people will read tweets on instagram yeah you can screenshot tweets and put them into a 10 thing swipe mm -hmm. and people will read every single one if it's well done like yeah. i read i read tweets all the time on instagram i get my news from instagram and then i go follow up on twitter so you can repurpose things from twitter that you find interesting and just use it as content um, you can still maybe have uh you know that first picture be something aesthetically pleasing so that your page looks clean but you yeah. can have nine other things after that. You can put videos in. I mean, the same, you do it on your story all the time. Just put that on your main feed. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you always do it on the story. True. So. Yeah, I do that, but I need Lexip for it. I'm not doing the editing. So it's always teamwork and she's not always well, available. You, so. you should you should learn it. I mean, she should do the, maybe the front one with like the, the orange and the black and have it say mm -hmm. like the cool title. But like, as far as screenshotting and adding a highlight or just resizing a picture, you can handle that. I mean, that's not that bad. True. Oh, yeah, I agree. I'm just, just challenging you. Or... Just challenging yeah, you. True. Yeah. Throwing down the really busy with everything at the moment. So, but definitely I'm always thinking of new posts and then I just contact Lexip and we uh, go on to something new. And she always produces. Uh, it's, it's fascinating how fast our teamwork is considering... She really needs to do it besides her normal job. But but I guess I guess what I'm team. saying for you, the opportunity I really see for you is that you don't even have to come up with that much original content. No, you just have to act as an amplifier for exactly. all yeah. the great content that's already out there. Yeah. And because you're the only voice right now on Instagram, that you know, if you become like very very media rich, um, like it might be harder for people to share or tag their friends on a story or they might miss it or they didn't get online but if you have it in the feed and you start to push every day like also the stories kind of get lost sometimes like True. maybe someone's not on instagram and you show up 13th on their stories and they only made it through eight um if you post on the feed like eventually it'll probably hit their main feed so you just stay in people's face every day yeah i think uh, i will do more with those videos on instagram apparently they are pretty good for the algorithm and they don't mess up the the front page because it's it's on the second page but it still shows up on your feed so um yeah i'm thinking of possibilities on instagram i'll definitely be back um you're doing a great job you're doing a great yeah. job i only say this because you said like i'm trying to think of new ways so i'm just throwing some ideas yeah. at you thank you i appreciate all the feedback from everyone uh, we're just always thinking of new ways to communicate with everyone now we're just pushing twitter a little bit more because I really want to get us going there too. You're almost uh, at a thousand, right? Yeah, it's it's going really fast. <laughs> yeah. So that's yeah. Uh, that's great, and um, uh, yeah, because I think Twitter makes life a little bit easier. Uh, you can you can more easily connect with people, but I also want to bring that back to another platform. So yeah. Um, want to shift want to shift gears, uh, Greg? Your yeah. next your next thread is that going to be on the Financial Times thing? It is, yeah. So I've outlined that. Um, I haven't started really like going heavy. Um, 
I'm going to do that actually right after we record this. I'm going to start working a little more detailed on that. Um, I'm probably going to push it out this weekend. Oh, I'm definitely going to push out this weekend. It'll just depend on whether it's Saturday or Sunday. Um, tomorrow, there's a ton of stuff coming out, right? Between this podcast and the AMA or the, the Q&A that we're doing. Uh, <laughs> so I don't want it to get lost in the, in the shuffle. Yeah. Um, so, but I do, and I also want to make sure I give myself enough time to create something that, you know, people paid for me to go to this event. And I want to make sure that I put together something that's worthwhile and not just like, you know, just slapping it together. So uh, I'll be working on that for the next couple of days and you can expect that this weekend. Nice, 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 nice. Yeah, because I'm going to share my screen here for a bit. Um, there was a, this is visible to you guys, right? Yep. Yes, sir. Okay. Well, um, the Financial Times Live, there was... Uh, there, there were panels on the 26th and the 27th uh, of was it April. April already. Jeez. Um, and this was on crypto. And I, I, I forgot what was the title of the, of the thing. The entire thing. It's called the Crypto and Digital Assets Summit. Yes, that was it. And Gilbert Ferdian was there with Thomas Harjano and uh, a Bank of England dude. <laughs> Bank, Bank of Canada. Bank of, Bank of Canada, yeah, yeah. What was his, what was his title? Tim, again? Timothy Lane. Timothy he was like yeah. the deputy governor, I think. Yep. My God, and um, uh, one or two other people. Um, yeah, one well, from uh, FISA and uh, oh, yeah, the, the CEO. The FISA girl. I think her name was Catherine Hogg. Yeah, yeah Charlotte. Uh, I think Charlotte Hogg, C right? C what was her name? Charlotte, Charlotte Hogg. Charlotte, there you go. Yeah, yeah. Um, CEO of Visa Europe, and then the yeah. moderator. Yeah, the Gill Gillian, Gillian something or so. Yeah, um, but it was an interesting talk, I think. And 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 without um, showing too much of your hand, what what was the most interesting thing you picked up from that um, talk? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I'm actually going to rewatch it today because I watched it live at six in the morning here. So uh, I don't recall everything, but I'll, I can tell you what I remember standing out was other than our good friend, Timothy, uh, the, the Bank of Canada guy. Um, I would say that Harjano and Gilbert were the most impressive. The way that the other speakers referred to Gilbert uh, yeah. before he even spoke. Uh, there were four speakers on the panel, right? So we have the Bank of Canada Deputy Governor. We have uh, the CEO of Visa Europe. We have the Chief Technology Officer at MIT Connection Science. And we have Gilbert Verdian. And the three individuals that's, that are not Gilbert all spoke first before Gilbert. And uh, they went in the order that I just listed mm -hmm. and each one of them, well, not the Canada guy, but the moderator and the other two, both in their explanations of answering questions or just discussing the topic at hand would all be like, and I, you know, and Gilbert could probably talk about this or something like that. And they would refer to him. And he, as I like to say, was batting cleanup, right? He was batting in the last spot to just kind of like, you know, best for last, um, and, you know, I remember him and Harjano really delivering um, some insights. They were definitely the most technical uh, on the board, on the panel. And uh, I was able to actually <clears throat> submit a question because I was a paid ticket member. They had like, uh, you know, an audience little chat box that you could put in questions for the speakers. And so I thought, all right, what's a, I want to kind of like, give them like a, on a silver platter to kind of like talk about, you know, quant or ODAP actually. And first engineer. <laughs> yeah. I, I didn't want, but I didn't want to make it obvious either. So I kind of, I did an, I did an anonymous post, like this is from an anonymous, you know, listener. And I said something along the lines of, you know, from a technical perspective, will there, because they were talking about central bank digital currencies and what a wholesale and retail CBDC would look like and some of the challenges. And so I said, from a technical perspective, will there be a platform or protocol 
that all these central banks can agree upon to do wholesale cross-border payments. And there was only a few questions in, in, in the box. And so they read it and uh, they went to Harjano first. And that was where the quote that you see on Quant Network's Twitter that's getting kind of retweeted about Quant is doing is the one like that's doing all the right things, or maybe you can find it. Yarno, it looks like you're looking for it. I, I know you're little, you're uh, you're searching face now, um, <laughs> and and uh, they they you know that was one of the better quotes that came out of it was Har Harjano saying that Quant is doing all the right things, uh, Gilbert and his team at Quant, and then they passed the mic to Gilbert after that to extend on the answer, and Gilbert mentioned ODAP, uh, the Open Digital Asset Protocol which is what you know uh, the protocol that Quant is building Overledger to be compliant with. It's kind of this open new internet uh, where Quant's Overledger product is you know, a private product that you know, lives on that open protocol. So both of those were mentioned uh, in response to my question, which I thought was awesome and worked out exactly as I, you know, as, as I planned. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so that was the part that, that stood out to me the most was just the quality of information coming from those two individuals. And then the fact that I was able to uh, get my question through and get some, you know, juicy quotes out of it. I am terrible at multitasking. Tim, can you look, uh, look up that, uh, that quote thing? I can find I can. it. I can find oh, it. I, I, can, I can do it in the background. You guys keep talking. Uh -huh. Was there anything, Yarno, that you that you uh, you were able to to get a copy of that video or kind of watch the video at some point? Did you have any thoughts on it? Oh, sorry, I, I zoned out a bit. The question again. Sorry, man. What was your thoughts on the panel? Yeah. Um, you said that Gilbert and Arjona were the most technical. I think there were, they are the most experienced and knowledgeable. Mm. Um, it, it, it was very obvious, especially when, when Gilbert brought up the, the Latin American dollar that's going to be coming in 2023. That's right. Um, but, but also from, from every, the way her John and, uh, and Gilbert spoke on the subject, it was very, very on point and very much from experience if that makes sense especially compared to, to the others I think the, the the woman from Visa came across as, as if she was still kind of guessing and as if everything was kind of hypothetical the guy from the Bank of Canada was just with his head in the sand he probably read like maybe a glossary maybe and, and, and maybe had a little bit of an idea, but he struck me as um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to retire before this is going to happen. So I don't give a shit and, and it's not going to happen. It's not going to, it's going to affect me at all. He kind of struck me as that, but, but, but Harjano and, and Gilbert, how they spoke as, as if it, it is already happening, which it obviously is. And with it, I mean, CBDCs, um, Latin American dollar, uh, being the prime example, uh, Gilbert stated again that it's going to be live in 2023, which is super amazing, that it's going to be pegged to the US dollar, um, which I found interesting. Um, I, I don't know why, but it kind of surprised me. I would have expected that it would be pegged to um, a, a South American um, currency. Um, but but I, I thought that was very interesting and, and, and the way they just spoke about it. And you could also see Gilbert's, I could thought I could see Gilbert's nonverbal when um, the, the panel leader in the end um, kind of wrapped everything up. Uh, Gilbert wasn't all that pleased <laughs> about yeah. her. Remarks. She had a quote that wasn't, uh, well, if you go to, Tim, while we're on the quant page, if you go to mm -hmm. the last tweet on about this panel, they actually tweeted what she said. They just didn't finish the quote because it se it seems better. But go to, if you go to the last, yeah, must be. Uh, yeah, you're right. It would probably be up. Yeah, it'll probably show. This the was our friends, by the way. That's the, the Bank of Canada Tim. guy. I didn't get the gist that he was. I'm gonna retire. I just 
think that he thought he was a lot smarter than he was and he was just mm. saying stuff that's in like every article on cnbc.com mm. like stable coins are going to be in the private sector and cbdc's are going to be from the central banks and it's like yeah and you're on this is a cbdc leaders panel like i'm trying to learn something new but yeah so uh, no no keep going that's not the one mm. but this Yurun guy is from uh, another panel so yeah i yeah, reckon yeah. this is the last tweets we go down one more sure that's weird um i know it's somewhere but uh oh there we yeah. need interoperability and common standards concludes jillian ted but that's not what she said fully she said something along the lines of we need interoperability and common standards and I just don't know how we're going to get there or something like that, yeah. where she, yeah. she just, she basically just said that like, man, we really need this, but like, there's no solutions in sight. And like Gilbert's sitting right there, like lady, like, hello, because she also introduced him in the beginning and introduced quant like completely improperly. She was like, this is Gilbert who like has the, her, his company quant network who deals in like cybersecurity of blockchains. And it was like, no uh -huh. and you could see gilbert's face kind of like twinge a little bit like yeah. um and i don't know anything about this lady but uh you know she seemed like a good moderator she just clearly hadn't done her homework on quant that's all i find it also very interesting that she led like her, her final remark with her resume that she was like an anthropologist of sorts and i was like okay how how, how is this this relevant for the, for the, the argument you're gonna make but it's uh, so yeah, you I could see learned. Gilbert. You could see Gilbert's face kind of like cringe again at yeah. the end when she yeah. said, "I don't know like how it's going to happen." Um, you see Gilbert trying to hide it. I you mean, always can see it. You can always see it. You can tell the guy's got a bit. He's a bit of a. I don't even know what the word is. I don't know him, so I don't want to. But you could tell he's a little bit like. He's proud. He's a proud guy. Yes. You know what I mean. So yes. if you don't, if you don't see it. And you know that he knows, like he doesn't show it unless you're really looking for it. And we are, yeah, and yeah. you could tell that his, and like any of us would, if yeah. we were sitting there and someone basically was like, thanks for being on the panel guys. Uh, I don't know anything about your company. And he would just be like, it's kind of disappointing. You know, I get, yeah. I don't blame, I don't blame him for being a little bit frustrated by that. Yeah. Definitely. He's too polite for being on those. Yeah. He has to. He has to. He's the most, he's one of the more professional individuals. Yeah. And yeah, he yeah. didn't do the origin story in total because we kind of had a little bit of a, a well, not, not necessarily a wager going, but many of these panels, whenever Gilbert uh, shows up, he needs to start that with Quant 101. We introduced Bitcoin to the, <laughs> to the, to the Bank of England uh, with the white paper, blah, blah, blah. We were the first central bank to take a look at the paper. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And this time he, and he did that. You know, yeah. he, he did that. He said that exact yes. quote. And um, you had called that beforehand. I remember you mentioning that. But uh, he stopped after a minute. And, and and he stopped the origin story from there, which was really nice. Because I was really scared they got to go all the way through his paces again. Like he's like he my a, grandpa he, telling the same story over and over and over. He has a very good sense of uh, timing, though, in terms yeah. of... Um, like, he understands the environments in which he speaks. Yes. And so he doesn't, one of the reasons that he doesn't shill quant very hard is because he doesn't want to come off that way. It's very, you could tell that it's deliberate. And also in stuff like that, where like an origin story, so he doesn't want to be the guy that drags on. He wants to answer the question in the best way possible and, and show that he's a thought leader and then move along. Whereas you could tell with the Bank of Canada guy, he didn't really, not only did he not have the knowledge and it was apparent, but he also went on like the first answer. He went on for like yeah. six or seven minutes. And then when, right when you thought he was done and you could see everyone in the panel kind of take a deep breath, like it's finally <laughs> over. He like went, and then there's also this thing and like went on for another couple minutes. And it's I like, it's died. just a lack, it's a lack of awareness uh, that <clears throat> Gilbert does not have. He does not have any lack of awareness. No. I died when that happened. You saw everybody indeed hold their breath. Okay, is he done? And I believe Gillian even tried to, she did. Um, she she was like, all right, so and then he like cut her off and kept going. <laughs> I think the problem with these guys is that they they're in a managing position, right? So they never really get any people who tell them to stop. They they're, they're just used to that's what this I was his from. moment. This was his moment of glory. Yeah. And uh, but here's the thing about going for a long time. 
people don't care if you talk for a long time, if you're saying good shit, like yeah, exactly. keep it coming, keep it coming. If you're feeding me, if you're feeding me, keep feeding me. But when you like, don't understand that you're not actually providing value and you just are, it's a little bit, it's not like self-centered or it's just a little bit of lack of awareness. That's how I would say it. Yeah. True. Yeah. And I also noticed, I mean, I also watched the stream. I, I didn't watch the entire thing because it was also just do my work, answering emails and stuff. But I, I did catch the last part, like the last 30 minutes. And I really noticed that, the, the, especially the guy from the Bank of Canada, and um, I kind of read the room in the sense of what the speaker's positions were, right? So you had the guy from the Bank of Canada who was kind of, well, he just wanted to keep the status quo. That was kind of my position on it. Like central yeah. banks, uh, when they see oh, change, they, 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 they get very, very nervous because inflation has been 2% the past 30 years in Canada or 40 <laughs> years, and now yeah. it's 12. So he was already freaking out about that. And then you have all these new technologies and he was freaking out. They, he they started to have... quote like inflation number. He was like getting defensive about like Canada's monetary policy. Like exactly. Unquote. It was very yeah, weird. Yeah. And then you had the woman uh, from Visa. She was obviously selling her company, um, just telling what Visa was doing. You had Harjono in, in the room, who was just there for the technical perspective. And you had Gilbert just sitting there, just chilling, like, yeah, we, we already solved the issue. And yeah, I'm just here. Well, that's what one of the things that I think I'm going to I'm going to touch on in the thread uh, is one of my takeaways from the entire event was that I think that they spend a lot of time in multiple panels but especially in this one, focusing on retail side of the central bank digital currencies, because there's still so many obstacles to overcome, not just uh, the technical side, but most more importantly, like the governance side and the public perception side, uh, the privacy side, all of these types of things. Um, from the retail side, you know, because you have this third party, which is the public, there's a lot of other, you know, integrating with the commercial banks and having their own stable coins that are basically retail CBDCs that will be rebranded as the JP Morgan dollar or the Bank of America dollar or whatever. Uh, I'm not sure what your banks are over in the Netherlands, but whatever your favorite bank is, they're going to have their own stable coin that's pegged to whatever currency, maybe yeah. multiple currencies. Um, that's the challenge that the banks are facing right now and trying to figure out how this is going to all work. And what I noticed is that they don't really talk about the wholesale side because all that is, is all the bankers, central bankers getting in a room and saying, okay, what platform are we going to use? How are we going to solve this? And Quant has already solved that for them and they all know it. They just don't talk about it because of the white labeling and, and whatever timing scale they're working on to like come forward with it. Like at some point you have to imagine the press is in some respect, it's going to be like, how is this working? Like, what are you using? Um, maybe not on like an individual company basis, but when it comes to like all central banks doing like cross-border payments, it's going to be like, well, how does, you guys have been talking about interoperability in every single seminar and every single panel and every single round table you do. It's like, what's the deal? Like you're building on Corda and you're building on Algorand or you're building, like, I'm just making that, you know, you're building on Ripple or Stellar. How is this all working? Um, is it bridging? Like, what is it? I don't understand. And at some point they're going to need to say, no, we have this technology called Overledger where we use these multi-ledger tokens and they're interoperable via this API gateway system. And this likely won't be until ODAP is live. Uh, ODAP is going to take, according to Harjano back in January, said that it's going to take another one to two years to get through the IETF. Because uh, if you watch any of these conversations in the IETF, it's like, it's like a, it's a arduous process. Like it is, uh, is that the right word? It's, it's a, it's difficult to get through like what they're doing. And there's a lot of details. These papers are like very explicit. And so in order to publish these drafts and to make them official and become the new TCP IP or the BGP or the SMTP, which is email, HTTP, which is your browser protocol, like these are the foundational protocols of the internet. And that is what ODAP is aiming to be for Web3, the, the upgrade of the internet that allows for digital assets to flow and not just information like pictures and text, like actual economically valuable assets 
there's a whole other protocol that's needed for that. And that's ODAP. And that's going to take a while, a year or two. And that's also what the CBDCs are going to be built on. They're going to be built on, uh, there's going to need to be more specific platforms like Overledger, that, but they're all built on an ODAP standard. And until ODAP is actually published, I don't believe that CBDCs from like major countries will be at scale, um, or at least they'll be, I mean, I per, perhaps they can still interoperate through Overledger, even if ODAP is not like officially published, but it's always been kind of my, th my thought that we're not going to see you know, the US digital dollar, the, US, uh, the, the digital pound, the digital euro until end of 2024, 2025 at the earliest, especially with, you know, the US presidency rolling over at that time um, in 2024, at the end of 2024. So I can't imagine Biden or anyone just like at the end of their term, you know, just kind of like launching this. It's going to be probably the initiative for the new president. Um, and the U.S. will lead a lot of the G7 and G20 countries, and people just look to the U.S. and what are they doing? So uh, at that point, I think a lot of it will be on Overledger. Um, so yeah, just back to the original point is I don't think the wholesale side of things is discussed much because I think everyone that's working on it knows that that side's been solved. The questions are still around the retail CBC side. It's yeah. I think I, I agree. Mean, you could. Yeah, you could very well be right. I mean, uh, you said, well, the world might look at what the US is doing, and especially here, being European, here in the EU, we have so many countries uh, going to be, well, going to collaborate on this. And, um, well, we have a lot of countries working together. It's going to take a while. So I, it would logically be that one of those bigger countries, which just can, well, sovereignly make decisions, uh start it can start this entire process on the other hand yeah. um i think everything is technically possible already we're just waiting for all the laws and regulations to catch up but it will also demand leadership and we can definitely expect it around that time so if you if, if you ask me now i would say 2026 2027 so like five years something like that might very well be the date for cbdc's and i have this little theory that we might see a digital euro appearing in 2027, like 25 years after the uh, introduction of the original euro, might be a very good date for something like that. I do wonder, I I'd, be inter I'd be interested what you guys think about, um, do you think that there will be any sort of kind of like inherent competition in terms of like, you know, it, like to your point, it may take five years, but maybe at year like three and a half, some countries start to push it, maybe like Switzerland or some of these forward thinking technological companies, uh, countries. Um, and then some other countries are like, hey, we need to like hurry up. We need yeah. to like get in the mix here. We like, we're kind of dragging our feet a little bit. Do you think that that'll happen? And we could maybe even see stuff sooner because there's no. like maybe competition's not the right word, but just uh, inspiration from other I countries? Think I think Sweden would be a very good example. Uh, also, Gilbert mentioned that they were in talks with the Central Bank of Sweden together with Oracle as a partner. Well, knowing the that Riksbank. Sweden, yeah, the Riks, the Swedish Riksbank, something like that. Um, and well, considering the fact that if you go to Sweden, everything is digital already, they completely ruled out cash. While well, you can still pay with cash, but it's very, very unusual. I think they're a very forward-looking country. They are always on um, well on the progressive side of things. So I think a country like Sweden might really take the lead as a Western country doing this. And sure, we already have the sand dollar on the, on the Bahamas. We will see the Latin American dollar next year. So we will have these test cases. But yeah. I think that the major economy is going to switch to it. It will be one of those countries, I think. So yeah, it, yeah you it might will, be right. Yeah. It, it will be drip, drip, drip for the coming two years. And that will be all at once. Because once it is done, and, 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 and the fear subsides. I mean, that, that is my main thesis on, on why everything takes so long and is so quote unquote difficult is, is simply because fear, um, same in the, for the normal people, fear of losing their cash, fear of losing their anonymity, fear of losing. And, and it's, it's, it's usually just a, a, a lack of knowledge or a lack of understanding. Um, but it's, it's, it's all founded in fear. And the same goes with, with governments. Nobody wants to implement this um, going over thin ice and, 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 and goofing it up. Um, but what I also think, 
uh, because fear also works the other way, is that when you look at China, um, maybe then Latin America, maybe Africa, um, those countries have um, bigger incentives, stronger incentives to, to, to push quicker to that. Mm -hmm. And we discussed that after the panel with the mobile phones. Um, mobile phones are, are eminently suited to, um, to, 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 to be used for the new digital economy uh, with CBDCs, retail CBDCs. And if you do not have the infrastructure like we have here with ATM machines and everybody has cards and stuff, there are also a lot of interests being the banks earning lots of money with the cards, people having accounts and stuff. Yeah. Um, so in infrastructure is already here, but where there's no infrastructure. Um, and You can leapfrog. Uh, yeah, sport, exactly. Yeah. Mobile phone towers being put up um, and, 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 and getting people to... Um, Banking the unbanked, that's the term. That's where I went. Um, when the Western countries, the bigger countries, see um, how that can elevate status of those countries, I think they, 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 they want to rush. They don't want to be last, maybe, um, or lag behind. But even then... That, that's also a thing, because you can get criticism for being too quick and fuck up. But you can also get a lot of criticism for, for, for lagging and not keeping up. And maybe the latter is, 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 is a bigger problem. But even then, with, with countries, I mean, rushing forward, there are also some interests of well, established companies which can delay technological process, uh, progress. Like, look at Germany. It's a very advanced economy, but on the technical side of things, they are uh, years behind. They're still using fax uh, machines. <laughs> they are so far behind. Uh, but they are one of the most advanced economies in the world. So it's really interesting how that works. And um, we, we also discussed this with Niels, the, the network uh, engineer. He also said that like the, the less infrastructure is in place, the easier it gets to just rush to new things. Well, yeah, that's really interesting because in Africa, you bring up, um, I think Africa is fascinating to me um, because of a number of reasons. One of which is that they basically skipped the whole like personal computer thing. Um, exactly. They're going yeah. straight from... Uh, you know, I guess televisions and landlines straight to mobile inner, like they didn't have an internet kind of step stone. They're just going straight from no internet, no dial up, no, dial -up no, modem. They no internet access at all, no, straight no. to the smartphones. Yeah. And, um, they don't deal with desktop websites and stuff like that. So, um, you know, you see countries like Kenya and Nigeria that I think Kenya is the highest cryptocurrency usage in the world. And I remember when there, uh, less than a year ago, there was some political kind of, uh, you know, uh, there was a political movement that went on the back of Bitcoin in Nigeria um, for like, there was a, some stories about that for a week or two that I read that, um, you know, because they couldn't fund certain campaigns or whatever it may be, they used Bitcoin. So these countries are, ready for this technology it makes a lot of sense for them as they start to get more and more internet infrastructure into their their continents and i watched i actually have a clip that i'm going to put on twitter i don't know probably next week or sometime this weekend uh there is a lady who's working very closely with the central banks in africa who she's talking about the same stuff about interoperable cbdc's and they have 50 something countries in africa and Maybe they'll have an African currency, but maybe they'll also have a lot of more localized country currencies that need to interoperate. And so again, like I haven't seen any links of like Quanta Africa, let's say, but this is a problem and a and solution that needs to take place uh, yeah. and needs to be get taken care of. And isn't uh, uh, Terra active in in Africa? I, I, I always, whenever we talk about Africa, uh, Luna Terra always pops into my mind. I have a feeling that they are doing something over there. Probably. They may be. The only thing I can recall is like that, that little like Cardano initiative in Ethiopia, where like they're providing like digital identity in schools and stuff like that in, in a small subsect of Ethiopia. And that's been like their marquee headline for like a year. And uh, yeah. they still don't have, still have smart contracts. Um, Do you know <laughs> where 15% of my followers are from? 
Nigeria. Africa. Wow. Nigeria consists of 15% of my followers on Instagram. I want to check my Twitter, actually. I've so never checked that. The United States consists for 21%. Then you have Nigeria, 15%. In the UK, 10%. Australia, 6%. And then Germany, 4.5%. So around one in six people following me on Instagram is from Nigeria. Where are you guys? Where's your social presence? Come on. <laughs> really appreciate the fact that you're here. So it's a shame that it's completely well, it's completely a European discussion again, and, and <laughs> with Americans in it. Hey, while while we're talking, um, website, quant new website coming. True. Yeah. Um, shall I bring it up, Jarno? Yes. Uh, uh, me, meanwhile, yeah. I'll read the tweet. It yeah. reads: "A new quant website is coming. We're working on a new website about how much of the future of finance." will be built on blockchain leave us your email address to be sure you're one of the first to know when it's live hashtag the future of finance today what do you guys make of that hashtag by the way because that's like that's like quants yeah central hashtag yeah um I, i'm not sure i think it's telling i think there's uh, enough f's in it and enough t's That's a good analysis, Yarno. It's uh, <laughs> very symmetrical. Okay. T F O F T. Tim, over over to okay. you, Tim. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So basically, I'm gonna put this here. Uh, so basically, we have this uh, well Gmail account uh, for the Pompey Show, and obviously, I uh, well I applied for uh, marketing emails. So yeah, when when you do that, you go in this screen. And it's all live. We haven't uh, done anything with it yet. And it says, quant marketing emails update your profile. Now, it reads for everyone listening on the platforms. Uh, we've received the request to change your sub subscription preferences for quant marketing emails. If you made this request and would like to change your preferences, use the link below. Uh, we did, so I'm just going to click this. Now it sends us to a website. It reads, update your preferences. We sent two types of emails, alerts. Send as soon as new content is available and digest a monthly roundup of our best content. That's cool. And our content then spans news, respective research, uh, case studies, events, and careers. So, uh, okay. We, yeah, that, I'm not going to box myself too much here, but you can imagine what happens if you uh, fill in all those things. Well, I can call us Mr. Quamfi. Shall we do that? Sure. Yeah. Okay, Mr. Mr. Quomfy, last name, holder, job title, influencer, <laughs> company, the Quomfy Show. This is riveting content. Image URL. <laughs> yeah, let's, let, let, let's, let's scroll yeah. down. Okay. Sh show what, show it, show it. You yeah, and then there. you get a drop down menu or no. It's not a drop-down menu, but you just get a list of options. Uh, and it says, well, what kind of emails would you like from us? And then all those things they mentioned above again. And the final question is, how would you describe your relationship to Quant? Now, here is where it gets interesting. Uh, they name enterprise customer, channel partner, developer, journalist, employee, uh, prospective customer, prospective partner, prospective developer, prospective employee. And last but not least, Q and T holder, and yeah. that's what I find interesting. Well, I think they're realistic. I mean, they know that they're going to get the community is incredibly passionate. They're probably, I would imagine, that a vast majority of their early signups will be community members. So to not acknowledge them as existing, I think, would actually be odd. So I don't, I don't find it that that weird that they have that. Um, I agree. But, it's right there at the end where they, you know, they think we belong. So <laughs> at the bottom of the barrel, <laughs> I get it. I get it. I think it makes total sense to me. Yeah, it does. Okay. But, but still, like, what is the, the added value for them to kind of, I mean, to silence us on social media perhaps, but apparently we are a value to the company still, even if you're just a simple holder, how would you, how what do you mean by silence us on social media 
not silence us, but just if we get more, we always complain about the lack of engagement, right? So the, yeah, well. yeah. So, so that would be a strategy for them. But I still find it fascinating that they mention it specifically um, because we don't owe them anything. Well, they know we exist. I mean, they just want to have they want to have demographics on their email list. That's all they want to know. I mean, we don't know how they're going to use that per se. They probably don't even know how they're going to use that yet. But mm -hmm. you might as if you can get that information about who are you, you might as well. And they know that we're that we're there. It doesn't I don't think it says that they feel good or bad about us. They mm -hmm. just acknowledge that we exist, which is undebatable. Right? Yeah. True. Yeah. And, 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 and I do think that the quant holders, and I made this case in the Dutch show as well, is um, we're really important. We are important for the decentralization of the network because we are the, primarily the ones that are going to run the remote connecting gateways. And right now, we're um, maybe a little bit on the um, on the naughty bench after the, the Oracle uh, shenanigans. Fiasco. <laughs> Fiasco where people were calling when moon in the in the comment section or in the in the question boxes but um we, we are very much needed and 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 we are very much um part of the ecosystem in the future and wh when gateways when they are needed i mean the purpose of the gateway is not to make you and i rich the purpose of the gateway is decentralization of the network and verifying transactions and, and, and without that functionality needed, gateways will, 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 will take some time. And that also means that we have to wait a little bit because until that, um, yeah. Yarno, so, I think you said in, in a nope. previous episode, um, oh, sorry to cut you off. I thought you were finished. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I was going to say that um, something you said, you articulated it very well in a previous episode about like how people feel about like, oh, Gilbert didn't update us or, you know, when the gateways are being delayed and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, you said something along the lines of like, if you need Gilbert to come and pat you on the back and tell you everything's going to be okay, you know, like this might not be this, like you need to either get over that or find another project. Because the reality is that none of us are owed anything by them. And yeah, we've put in some money into their token, but, and, and, and I suppose, you know, the rise in price of the token and all that like helps fund the company. I think that's real and that's fine. And I think we get, it's a long-term play and it's like, they're spending their time in a way that will make you rich if you can shut up and hold on. And that's the deal that we made. That's the deal we made in this, in this project. It's not another crypto company and you should know that by now. And if like, if you're not comfortable with that, then just peace out. And if you are comfortable with that, then just put your head down and do the work because there, you don't know everything. You don't, if you're complaining about that, I guarantee you're in the bottom half of knowledge. So oh. like get your research game up, try to contribute to the ecosystem or just put it on a hardware wallet and go find another fun project where you can talk to the CEO every day. Uh, you know, it's, it's very simple. Like there's no... It's not a gray area where Gilbert's like, hey, I'm going to be there next week and he doesn't show up. He's been very clear about how things are going to operate from day one. You know, we are not a crypto company. We're an enterprise company that has a token. Big difference. Sure. Yeah, he even said it himself. Well, if the expectation is to shill and hype crypto tokens with memes, then Overledger is not for you. There's a sea of Doge Shibu. Shibu? <laughs> I'm not sure if that's a typo from Lexip or that he actually typed that. I'm yeah, it's moon and meme tokens that already. I wouldn't do be that. I wouldn't be surprised if Gilbert said she moon. Yeah, and there's also a uh, quant. There was a T missing. Hmm. But besides that, yeah, no, indeed, it's um, we, we we are not necessarily the target audience quite yet, <laughs> to say the very no. least. People have this, it's, it takes a certain, I was just saying this on Tokenizer yesterday on his show where it's like, there's a certain level of like, uh, struggling for the word, but it's like this expectation that you deserve something. Yeah. Like, it's like, hey, Gilbert, make me my millions faster. Yeah. I'm going to do nothing, Yeah. but I want you to make it faster and 
let me know how it's going more. I don't have enough updates from you, by the way. So hurry up and keep me in the loop because I'm over here. I did my part. I put it, I bought 50 quant. So I know like that I should be getting more up. Like there's, it's just this, um, I'm struggling for the word. There's a word for that, uh, where you're just, you know, you're, you're entitled, you're entitled. Um, and you know what, when you feel like that, you should probably reassess, you know, your relationship with the project and with money and with yourself and with life. Like we're doing absolutely nothing that I, we are doing absolutely nothing to earn the wealth that is potentially around the corner. Get that through your head. Like, oh. How come all the people that are contributing to the community more than you are not complaining and you are? Ask no. yourself that question. Yeah. Um, what I do often feel is that when I think when that new, it, but, sorry, you know, you know. I thought my mic was muted. Hmm. <laughs> what what I often feel is that um, more often than not, people that have that quote unquote mentality are are newer to the uh, to the project or or or, or not as as read up or informed um there are obviously exceptions there are some <clears throat> sorry there are some ogs that are um getting more and more the, the entitlement jacket on <laughs> mm. uh, asking the the questions feeling that they've been here so long that now they they have a right to to certain things um but given that um, it, it, it is logical for a lot of people if they come from other projects that that they expect the same and then again um, I need to give credit to the community because we are very very good in grooming our new community members and you can call it indoctrinating but it's uh, I think we, we, we groom new members very well we educate very well and, and and we get them on board with the program so to speak but it's it's a very very stark contrast compared to say xrp or or doge or or shib or or whatever um it's a totally different culture it's a totally new dynamic that's never really existed is like this idea of like hardcore passionate communities behind b2b companies like that doesn't exist as far as i can tell like there's no like like rampantly passionate like amazon like community you know what i mean i mean maybe there is for like um <laughs> there probably is for like uh like this amazon like third party sellers and stuff but like just in general like people that own amazon stock don't all like chill in a room and they're like where's bezos he hasn't updated us it's like look at the product dude <laughs> it's like think quan is Quan has been remarkably consistent with their product releases, especially since the new year. And that's like the proof is in the pudding. You're seeing like the panels that they're contributing to, the papers that they're putting out, the, the hype that they're getting, like the, and more importantly than all of that, what Gilbert has said over the past few years about predicting how things are going to go, it's unfolding exactly in that way. Mm. And so you have to continue to put your trust in the team because it has all proven right thus far. And right now the team is saying, hang on, we'll get to you when it's time. And in the meantime, let us work with all these clients. We have an incredible amount of overwhelming demand. Like that sounds pretty exciting as a token holder, as far as I'm concerned. So that's all I need to hear until, mm -hmm. until further notice. Yeah. True. Sorry for interrupting you. I just something popped through my mind and <laughs> but but you talked uh, you kept on going that was great um i think the the only example but it's not really a business to business company might be tesla in its more early days there was this uh group of frantic fanatics about tesla they were really uh well on the background they were really discussing the company all day because they, they saw what was coming they saw what musk was planning to do they saw the master plan they understood it they all became millionaires after that because they just they just saw it coming and everyone was skeptical. No, nobody, nobody understood Tesla. And then those people knew that it wasn't necessarily a car company, it was it was a tech company. That that's that's a good comparison because there's like that that kind of um you have that central figure leader that everyone can rally behind that like is the visionary. But I also think it's still I think glossing over the fact that it's not B2B is an important distinction because yeah. 
the product that Tesla puts forward, they get to interact directly with the product. And so it's sure. like they, as things come out, it's like they're building excitement around like what we're going to receive as far as their output of this visionary company, where with Quant, we don't really interact with the product. And so we, we don't even have full insight into the product. And so it's like, we have to put a level of trust and like, yeah, I think the idea of just having a B2B company with a community is very odd because sure. when you have B2C, that community can like Apple has probably a pretty strong community. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. cause they're consumer products. Um, I just struggle to think of like, and I did say Amazon, that's pretty much a B2C company. So that's not even that good. Cause I mentioned they probably have the third party sellers and all that as well. But it, yeah, I can't think off the top of my head. Oracle of like, maybe? Yeah. Do they have like a passionate community of like people that are like rallying around in Telegram? Like, you know, it's no. like. No. It's just so, a blue chip company. Or so, this is, so, so to your guys' point, like. No. To Yarno's point specifically about the, the the moderation in the Telegram and the way that we handle new people to the community to make sure that everyone is like, hey, like when you come in and go, hey, what's wrong with the price action? It's like we already know that like you we have to shift your mindset a little bit. This is different than anything that's happened before. And we're all still learning ourselves. Like we're trying to like it's not like we're perfect or that we don't experience frustrations. I mean, we do, but you have to zoom out. And you have to remember like what the bigger picture is here. Good, good example for this grooming is, um, and, 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 and Jeff actually did that with me more often than not. Um, the way we respond under tweets. And I was never the, 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 the one tagging the CEO in, in some uh, when moon kind of bullshit tweet. Um, but I, I was the one posting kind of inappropriate, um, but very interesting gill gifts under um company things you know when, when we got a shout out by i can't remember let's say sdx because that's what's on top of my head um top of mind i i posted some some gif and, and and jeff was like okay dude um this is like a partner that is actually um promoting quant we don't want to be posting crazy gifts or or or, or when moon or or whatever stuff I'm Jeff's there, amazing we... at that. Jeff's amazing at that. Like just keeping everyone like in line and yeah. making yeah. sure like, Hey, guys, like, keep it as professional as possible. Yeah. I even received a message from Jeff just about two days ago, um, requesting something along those lines. And we had a conversation about it. He's not like a dictator about it. Nope. Um, but he was like, Hey, you might want to consider doing this in some of your tweets. And we had a constructive conversation about it. So mm -hmm. he always has, uh, his eye on the prize. And again, like just to call, just to, to shine some light on him one more time. It's like, he's the only guy that I can tell as far as I know, that's been here since day one and is still contributing at the same level and leading yeah. the pack. Yeah. And he's doing so in a professional way. And so, yeah. Um, just huge props to Jeff for everything he does. Absolutely. Born Quamfi, by the way, is his handle on, uh, yeah, I had the same experience with Jeff well. sometimes. Then, yeah, sometimes I post, I repost stuff from what I see on Telegram, and then it turns out to be stuff I couldn't share. And, and there was this one thing I, I can't remember what it was, but oh, I think I do actually. There was some kind of uh, mention of Overledger and Quant as a partner from some I Italian payment company. It wasn't CI or Nexi, and it was another country called the name. Uh, and everyone forgot the fact that on, uh, in, in, in the corner of the document it said confidential. And, and nobody saw it. Everyone was just openly sharing it all over the internet. They just said, well, guys, it clearly states that we can't share it. So We cleaned that up so fast, too. It was incredible. Yeah. Like, yeah. like I know, I'm pretty sure I know which document you're talking about. It got, like, a little bit leaked. And it got leaked off of a big account, I think. One that doesn't... I don't want to call it out, but I, I'm pretty, from what I heard anyway, it's one of the bigger quant Twitter accounts that doesn't really interact in the telegram at all. And we got it taken down from there and kind of everywhere else. Yeah. And it's back to, it's back to like under the rug. Yeah. So. Uh, and that, that one cleaning operation. Yeah. The document was found on the UK gov. No, 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 it's no, it's oh. not that document. It, it's, it's something else. 
okay. th there was the there yeah, was there that uh, other cases. document. Yeah, that, that that was the, the that was the most clean operation I've ever seen. Yeah, we, the we fact that we can that we can do that and that we want to do that. Uh, and everyone yeah, has to respect. We have the <laughs> best interests of the company, right? Yeah. Yeah. There it's was also cool. on, cool. on LinkedIn. It was apparently uh, it was Martin Hargreaves in the DM on LinkedIn, uh, sharing information about the timing of the the the, the internal gateways. Turns out later, uh, Jeff also said, "Hey, what are you doing?" And I took it down. But later on, I heard from friends, "Hey, that's that's uh, a DM on on LinkedIn. Why are you sharing that?" I wasn't even aware. My DJ and brain was just like, mm -hmm. "Hey." information i have to post it yeah. here's some alpha let's go <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah sometimes you just get too excited um i think we have actually a lot of questions this episode oh yeah that's, we, that's we actually got some questions yeah we, we do i think people recognize your name greg and suddenly uh they want to ask questions because Jono and well, i never uh well we get guests we get the proper questions <laughs> yeah i hope I'll, I'll do the best that i can hopefully uh yeah. I understand. Oh, what is your background? Know. Someone, Adam, asks on Instagram, what, what is your background? So if you, you don't have to dox yourself fully, but what did you do? Or uh, Yeah, so I'm originally born and raised in New York City. Uh, I grew up there until I was about 13. My family moved to Connecticut, uh, which is just a neighboring state. We lived about an hour outside of Manhattan. So my dad could still commute and work in the city. I went to high school there, went to college in Indiana, just a bunch of random states you guys probably don't know. Um, and then uh, moved back to New York. I, I got a job in marketing. So I majored in marketing and I've been working in marketing my whole career in some respect, whether that is uh, doing like landing page optimization for say, like uh, kind of product salesy websites or uh, email marketing, email advertising, email delivery, uh, running social channels, um, creating content of different kinds. Uh, and then I moved to Los Angeles, started a bunch of different like little projects and businesses that all flopped. And then uh, I built an audio, a social audio app, a dating app, actually. So I don't know if you guys ever use dating apps, but it's a lot of like swiping pictures and then texting. And it's very impersonal. It's very difficult to um, really connect with anyone or get to know who they are before trying to meet them, something like that. So I built an audio speed dating app where you essentially meet people and have these like little three to five minute voice calls with people uh, to get to know them better as your initial interaction and launched that soft in LA with a, you know, a partner of mine and then realized that I didn't really want to be a tech CEO because it's just, it just wasn't the life that I wanted to live. Like I couldn't forecast it past like I did it because it was fun and I wanted to prove my concept, which I think I did. And Clubhouse came out after that and Twitter after that with spaces. And this was before all the social audio stuff. So I, I knew I was onto something and I think I've been proven right. Uh, and people really enjoyed the experience, but I didn't really want to lead that company. So I kind of put that aside. And um, I worked at a esports company in LA doing product marketing. Um, and then crypto started popping off again in 2020 and I kind of went full-time crypto and uh, the rest is history. So um, started talking a lot on Clubhouse about crypto, started really pushing quant, doing some trading, made some nice, nice moves and, um, you know, got to a point where uh, I'm not where I want to be by any stretch, but like, I don't have a full-time job at the moment. So I'm, that's why I'm able to put so much time into creating this content. And thankfully there are some opportunities that are knocking on my door now because of the content that I'm putting out. So I've found this way to like align myself with what I enjoy doing, what I'm good at doing and what people want. Um, and then the, I think the money will follow. So hopefully I can, yeah. you know, I have some potential opportunities to like create quant content and get paid and, and things like that. So um, I, I told, I said this on tokenizer, Yesterday, so that was the first time I kind of publicly said it, but I'll say it again, is I actually applied to Quant uh, about a month ago um, to be a product marketing manager at the company. So I don't know exactly what that would look like if it were to move forward um, and like what my personal side content would obviously have to take a, 
a change. It wouldn't be, you know, I couldn't really be talking about, you know, certain aspects if I were to have you know eyes on that. But um, so that would be interesting. And I don't know if they'd want me to like move to the UK or anything, but that's something that I think would be really interesting to like do something similar to what I'm doing now and helping people understand the technology and also like work for the company. I think that would be dope. So that's kind of where I'm at now. Um, but I'm not like attached to that outcome by any stretch. I just think it would be like a cool opportunity and I have some other things that are in the background that are working. So yeah, my background is basically just, uh, I'm a city kid and uh, background in professional background in marketing. And I love crypto. So you can confirm that you're not a lizard and it ties into another uh, question. Please don't be the deep states. You're also not part of the deep state, right? Uh, go to the next question. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, okay, uh, so another question is, um, I've heard some stuff about Q&T in healthcare. So how does that work? So a question from Nate. I think um, this is something that Jarno and I could pick up in another episode. In our I can tell you what I know, which is not a lot, which is that Go ahead. Overledger basically started in Australian healthcare when Gilbert was working at New South Wales healthcare. Um, and he was basically approached by ISO and we're like, Hey, can we make this into a standard? This is really interesting. This interoperability of data and how that works. And that was the start of ISO TC 307. So I know that healthcare is actually extremely foundational in the creation of this technology. And, uh, I know that Gilbert has also talked about talking to large healthcare companies. So the only sector that I've seen Gilbert kind of get passionate about and get bullish about, uh, even though there's a laundry list of potential use cases outside of finance and the cross border and all the central banks and all that is healthcare. Um, and I know that Oracle outside of finance, their number two thing is healthcare. And they just bought Cerner for what, 40, $35 billion yeah. a couple months ago to get sure. all this healthcare data. So that's pretty much all I know off the top of my head. I just know that it's pretty much the number two use case and, and next to finance for Overledger. Is it, uh, no. Isn't Lara, Gilbert's wife, not, um, doesn't she have a, a, a master or a history working in something with healthcare? She does. She definitely does. And uh, that's also kind of how the team itself ties into healthcare. There are some other links. We have this brilliant... Um, image of all the, the people on the team and their backgrounds and you see healthcare popping up a lot. And I'm also thinking about the thread that some once made somewhere last year um, where you kind of explained how this is something we need to dig up perhaps some other time because I, I will struggle to find this. Um, but it kind of shows the, 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 the approach that Quant takes. So instead of just approaching one company they, they approach entire sectors at once i think they're yeah. they are somehow tied to this this is all this like uh, the, everything is what's the word? Down. a consortium of, of like healthcare companies and i think it really is with uh it's some british company like the oh dear um what's the name i have no clue man Gle glexus smith klein i think that there's a leap there but i'm not sure what it is but i know that Plexus Smith Klein is leading some kind of healthcare consortium with blockchain, and it somehow ties into the team. But it does make sense. I know because... it's somewhere in my head, but I'm not sure how that works, and I need to look it up. Uh, yeah. Medical information, medical data um, is is always very privacy sensitive. Um, I mean, there there are no bigger quote unquote secrets than the, 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 than your than your medical history and your medical stuff. Um, and it's really difficult even now to um, have your data. Let's say you break your leg while you're on vacation in Turkey and, and you need to get your medical jacket over there. It's, it's a shit show um, to get that there. Um, in the future, we're going to have EPSI in, the, in Europe, um, which will be used most likely for that. Um, but from, from, from the medical perspective, you're going to get... Um, the self-sovereign identity. You're going to get um, all those things that um, 
it, 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 it starts with a very simple thing, which is data, mm -hmm. but there are so many things popping up from that, that all need yeah. the interoperability. It's like a flower with all the pebbles growing from it, um, which makes it super, super diverse. I mean, yeah, fi fi I, yeah. That's, go ahead. Now, finance is pretty, pretty straightforward compared to the, the entire medical stuff. And especially if you're gonna go, go gonna look worldwide, um, there are tons of different um, administrative things going on in in, in in hospitals besides just the, I mean, hospitals are just companies in themselves with very complex logistics. Um, you want to know the origin of everything. So uh, supply uh, chain stuff. Um, so it, 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 arguably, I think the healthcare is, is a lot bigger than finance. That's what I was saying. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. Um, I just to, to your flowering point about yeah. how how the, there's a lot going on and, and can come from it. Um, I think a lot about like also to like your self sovereign identity. Like I think there's going to be about owning your healthcare data, mm. uh, owning all of your data, mm. um, and how that will be allowed and accessible through a decentralized internet. Um, yeah, where you know you're going to see marketplaces open up that. Uh, like through something like Overledger and through API gateways where you can basically say, um, this is what ODAP does so brilliantly, is it basically the, the BGP side of it, right? The border gateway protocol side, where basically what border gateway protocol is, is it's saying, hey, I am a network or a system and here are all of the systems that I connect to. So if you want to route data through me, I can get you from, I'll show you where I can get to so that you can figure out the best way to route. So similarly with ODAP, it kind of like shows like, hey, this is the data that I have. Um, and you can do X, Y, or Z with it based on the permissions that like the owner has set. And so you're gonna see companies open up new revenue streams. You can see individuals take more power over their data and they're gonna create like these decentralized marketplaces where you can sell data and trade data and own data based on certain criteria that you select. And I think healthcare is going to be a huge, huge part of that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Nice. Tim, did you find what you were looking for? Or weren't you looking anymore? For no, I wasn't looking at that because uh, it's, it's, it's somewhere on Telegram. I don't, can't be bothered to, uh, <laughs> I'll look it up. I'll put it in our podcast uh, channel and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get back to it. Yeah, that's the um, downside of digging on the fly. You're going to miss most of the conversation. Multitasking is an illusion. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm finishing up with Instagram. We're going to some more DGN uh, questions. Uh, one question is, uh, what do we do with our quantities? Are we going to sit and wait? Well, I will. I'll be here for some uh, years. Yarno is too, I guess. With the tokens? So, yeah. Yeah, so what do we do with them? Do we just sit and wait or are we going to trade? Uh, what's our strategy? I guess that's different for everybody. I mean, if we don't have if we don't have a gateway or staking option, there's really only two options: is like hold them or trade them, and or sell. No. Yeah. Well, that I guess. I mean, if you want to completely exit, but if you want to sell and buy, then that would be trading. So yeah, it's yeah, like definitely. either yeah, if you're gonna stay in the project, mm -hmm. it's either gonna be holding or trading. Um, that's gonna be up to any single person. I think. If you're new to the crypto space, I think everyone kind of takes a shot at trading and then realizes, <laughs> you know, the less you do, the better you are. Yeah. Um, sometimes if you're good, you can make some like decent swing trades if you trade like once or twice a year and, and you're smart about it. But for the majority of people, holding is going to be your best bet and trying to just accumulate, uh, make sure you have streams of income in fiat and then just buying the dips and doing more research to as you put more money in, you're going to need more conviction in the project in order to feel comfortable in increasing your bag. So I would just say hold for most people is probably the plan and buy more if you're, if you have the conviction to do so. Yeah, no. I True. agree. I agree. Quant is not a token you want to um, fuck around with. There is so much in the air. Um, back Last year, when the when we were a forty dollars stablecoin, um, there were a lot of wrecked souls. 
A lot of people sold right before the rip. Yeah. Opportunity cost. You yeah. Know? yeah. And there is opportunity cost. Definitely. Like to sitting on a token that's not moving when everything else is. There is. But also try coming up with a plan and sticking to it because that usually works. And yeah. if you give up halfway through the plan and you change it, that's not to say you can never change your plan. But if you're just getting, if it's impatience, you probably want to park that and stick to the plan. And that worked out really well for the people that continue to accumulate at $40 instead of selling at $40. Um, I had something else, but I forgot. But yeah. Oh yeah. Um, just like the idea that like you might miss the pump is there's some stat, I'm not going to get it right, but there's something around Bitcoin where it's like, there's only like three weeks of the year or something when it does like 90% of its damage every year. So it's like, you can try and time that or you could just hold on. What do they say? It's not about timing the market. It's about time in the market. Yeah. So just, just have exposure and don't yeah. try and get cute. Yeah. And everybody gets their quant for the price that they deserve. True. And it also... Words kind of this mental exercise I have nowadays is I just look at the people in the world around me and I just think of there are so many people and, and probably I am the only person here in this space that knows about quant. I was at a festival yesterday, it was 10,000 people. And I was like, what are the odds that people know about quant? Turns out that one of my followers on Instagram actually was not the same festival. But then if all those people need quant, it's going to cause some hype at some point. We are just insanely early. Well, they okay. don't. I don't think they don't need quant, do they? I mean, no, but they need the Q and T token because there is hype, just like they need Shiba Inu and Doge. Mm. And at some point, they will want it. You mean. They will foam. Yeah, exactly. They will foam out to get it. What's mm -hmm. Quant going to do? Yeah, and and that ties in with another question. So, what is going on with quants? Uh, there's such great news, uh, but the people, but are the people afraid to buy? That's the question. I feel I feel the same way about it. Are, are people afraid, or is something else going on? I think it's, it has it's to do with complex. inflation. But I think that's just a that's just a price is down. Why is price down? Question, which is the True. same thing. Yeah. Which is quant is tied to Bitcoin at the moment, and and what's interesting is that we have seen quant in the bull market perform very differently from a lot of other tokens, and it's not just the forty dollars stable coin part. There was just a lot of days, me and my buddy would watch this like Hawks in the beginning. And like, there were just a lot of days where Quant was doing its own thing. Um, it it kind of had a bit of a life of its own. Now, more recently in the bear-ish times, uh, it's been pretty tied to Bitcoin and Bitcoin has been pretty tied to the larger markets. Yeah. And so the whole world is kind of syncing up uh, yeah, and it may, not, it may not be pretty, but um, I don't think that it's like, oh, people aren't buying quant. It's like people are selling everything yeah. <laughs> everywhere. Uh, that's all it is. I, I wouldn't look too deeply into that. Yeah. And it's not surprising at all because what everybody wants is adoption. Everybody wants adoption. Everybody wants that as many institutions and, 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 and their neighbors getting involved. But then when it happens and everything starts correlating with each other and one thing is not per se a hedge anymore that then people are complaining which is kind of weird i mean if you want if you want banks and hedge funds and vcs and stuff to invest in your token they are going to manage those tokens like they manage all their other things so yeah then uh, when the sap goes down we go down as well i think Maybe gateway gateways are going to be the thing yeah. that um provides a lot of i think hopefully stability and price yes. and also in invites big money in like not retail money but like mm -hmm. if enterprises start being like oh we can okay we finally see the value in this network um we're starting to and this may take another three years but it's like okay the, the digital asset transferring is happening interoperability is actually becoming kind of clear quant is a kind of a leader in this space we can actually put, we can buy their token and, and, and these different, you know, companies and VCs and hedge funds and all this stuff, they're going to look for ways to get creative, to preserve wealth, to generate wealth in a new economy. And 
and they're not afraid to make investments when the market's down because that's what they that's how they make a lot of their money and that's the general philosophy for a long time for you know the warren buffets of the world that's how you do it that's how you do real damage Mm -hmm. so if we enter into some sort of bearish phase like an even deeper bear and you have all these hedge funds and large players that have a lot of money that they're trying to allocate they're going to buy some bitcoin probably they're probably going to try and mess around in like ethereum ecosystem whatever it may be but a quant gateway solution could be a very interesting option because of these ecosystems that are going to start to to blossom through being able to connect it to traditional finance and you know these foreign exchanges and cross-border payments and the Latin American dollar. Oh, wow. Look at all this. That's where like a lot of the retail stuff's going to happen first on Quants Network is through these Latin American countries and enterprises and hedge funds are going to pick up on this eventually. And they're going to allocate to probably not just buying and holding a token, but if there's a way that they can get yield on that token in a blossoming ecosystem, that's an attractive proposition, especially once there's regulation that comes out that makes everything very clear and they can just do it. Um, yeah. We're just early. We're just early. Yeah, that regulation bit, that is a really important hurdle. There's a question about that regulation. So I, we, we move to Twitter. Uh, H. Quamfi, so I assume this person has become unquamfi. That's interesting. Uh, or not, it might just be a, uh, I don't know, it's just an assumption from my side. Uh, with the new regulations at the door, will it be possible to launch OVN community or can we consider it already dead? So yeah. that's an interesting question. That's the reason why I said <laughs> no, that. No, I think, I think regulation will help that move along. I mean, regulation is not going to say individuals and retail cannot participate in crypto or in to- the token economy. That's not what we're looking at. Regulation is coming to on the business side. It's like, you. it's more like the, to the distributors of the tokens, like, are you complying? Is your token a security? Are you legally offering this monetary instrument? And then to people that interact with it, it's just about it's more about the people that are providing the services, in my opinion. It's not about like restricting yeah. us as it is restricting them or at least giving guidance and clarity. So Quant is, is just not something you really have to worry about when it comes to the regulatory side of things. They're already com- doing everything in a, a way that will be compliant. Um, and any news that's coming out about that, they're already like white on rice with that. So. I think it's again the OVN community and the gateways and all that is more a question of quants timeline than it is anything to do with regulation. Yeah, true. And the regulation will indeed be to protect us to to to, to protect the consumer from um, from the ICO kind of shenanigans. And obviously, there's going to be some let's call it fallout. Um, <clears throat> that not all your wallets are going to be anonymous anymore, most likely. And maybe exchanges have to go share um, some of your data, maybe with the tax man. Um, Taxes need to be paid eventually. And I know that's um, cursing in the in crypto land, but the the, the wild west needs to end. And um, that, that, that will come with regulation. And eventually it will make everything better because when the regulation comes, all the people that are not in right now will be inclined more, Jesus, grammar, they will be more inclined to join when the, the rules of the game are established and everything is clear. And Bitcoin is no longer called uh, a, 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 a criminal safe haven. How, how ridiculous that yeah that sound to us true um so sentiment will change with regulation um both on the on the regulator side and on the consumer side i think and uh, i think it'll be really good especially for quant since we are so compliant already and all the shit coins will um then disappear finally die <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's my final point about that i think also with the shit coins disappearing at some point 
it will free up the space for developers to start working at actual companies. There's a huge shortage on the market. And once that space, there's also a lot of scammers, obviously, but I think it clears up a bit, then those developers can go to actual companies. Another question, I think. Uh, the Betruffian man is asking this question. Uh, Greg, what is your take on FLAR slash uh, Spark interoperability in comparison to Quant? Thanks. So if we, if we go to the the, the, the oh, flare the flare ripple and spark thing, yeah uh, don't have any I don't know enough about that unfortunately um, mm -hmm. I have heard flare get thrown around in an interoperability sense but I think it's similar to like I would imagine it's similar to like the way people say XRP is interoperability where it's like a some sort of settlement platform um, I think it's my understanding that flare is basically like ripple but like smart contracts. Um, I don't, I don't know enough, honestly, unfortunately, to, to okay. answer that. Fair enough. The only thing I know about Flare is that I'm still waiting for my airdrop. When, when airdrop? <laughs> Come on. When? Yeah, yeah. I, think, I think there are new promises the 4th of July. We'll see. We'll see what they do. Okay, uh, another question is from HeyCT. He says, big fan of the show, so thank you. Well, appreciate it. It's, it's so nice that we finally got people listening to us. Finally, it's, it's, it's so great. Uh, my question is, could q and remain undervalued? An example, uh, under five to 10 billion uh, by the crypto market, even when utilization dashboards kick in. q and is criminally undervalued now by the retail focused crypto market, but could this remain the case for the next three to five years? <laughs> and and he adds the the five to ten number isn't too important. My concern is whether QNT will never realize its full price potential, which is easily fifty to one hundred billion, uh, as its B two B focus is the polar opposite to the retail focus markets uh, we have now and will have for three to five years. So a long question, but basically, what well, it's about the valuation. In, in I'd be to the... very disappointed. And I said it before. I'm going to say it again. You can mock me in the comments. I'd be disappointed if Quant would not be one trillion market cap in 2030. Based on the projections of RollPal and the growth of the of the adoption and um, what the, the digital asset space will be worth and, um, and, and, and how big percentage of the current economy and infrastructure, including healthcare, will all be um, DLT based. And if you look at that, even if you if you now if the distribution stays the same and quant still is 0 0.01 percent um, of the of the crypto market cap, something like that, even then quant would be or was it a uh, hundred billion, something like that. So I just did some quick math. If you do get to a one trillion dollar market cap. Yeah. You know what that makes the token price? Yeah. Yeah, well, well over uh, over 100,000. It's uh 68,500. So Six, 68,000. Quick math. Quick math. Well, I did that in my head. I didn't I don't I didn't even use the internet at all. Um Ooh. but as far as this question goes, I think that um I would encourage you to read my thread on network effects. Um, if you guys can link that in the show notes, I think that, um, look, this stuff doesn't happen overnight. So yeah. is it going to continue to be undervalued for a period of time? Yeah, it is. Especially you give the idea of three to five years. Yeah. Yeah. I think that it will be, especially because CBDCs are going to be, I think the biggest like blast on the scene kind of first use case. Um, there will be many others Then maybe some will pop up here and there. But I think that is one that will take about three to five years to reach maturity as it is, uh, maybe even longer. So, um, yeah, I think it will remain undervalued for quite some time. But I like Yarno's kind of idea, of like end of the decade. Um, I think this will really be a very powerful, uh, you know, network. And looking back at kind of what Bitcoin was eight years ago. You can maybe get a similar idea. We'll move through a couple more cycles. Um, worst case scenario is that we go into this like global depression of some kind, mm -hmm. and it's like one long elongated 
bear market for like five, six years, seven years, whatever. And then we kind of, but, but I can't imagine money doesn't reallocate, right? It's like someone once said money doesn't die and go to money heaven. It's like when you pull out of these, you sell off all the markets and now a lot of it is like, the problem is that there's probably not, a, there's not really as much money as we think there is. Cause a lot of it is like all leveraged to the tits. Yeah. So that's the part that's kind of on, you know, that's scary. Um, it's like, how much money is there really to like invest? But the old money system is going to look to where can I put this? Where mm. can I put this? I think the people that are really going to get burned are the people that, you know, they're, they're the majority of the population, but the, where the majority of the money is going to try and find a new home. And Bitcoin is interesting to them. I think as like, a, they want to have some allocation to Bitcoin, but they don't see a way to get yield on Bitcoin. They don't see, um, they probably see Bitcoin as like, you know, reaching some level of maturity where I think like once they have fully wrapped their head around what like ODAP is and what Overledger is doing, um, I think a lot of people, a lot of institutions are going to look to it and, and, and but that's just going to take years. It's going to take years, unfortunately. So no. yes, you can stay undervalued for quite a bit. Yeah, it's not what we want to hear, but it's just the reality. I always yeah, think with this and, question, oh, and, and, and being undervalued is relative, right? I mean, it, it, in my opinion, we want, with what we know right now, um, let's say Lagchain, Sia, um, just those two. Is 1.2 billion market cap warranted? Maybe. If if gateways are not live, or probably, hope. perhaps. When gateways go live, what, what, what should then happen with the valuation? Would it go to 10? Would it go to 100 billion? I don't know. In my opinion, that would still be undervalued if you look at what is being solved and at what scale, especially compared to look at the top 10 projects. Literally, what yeah. the fuck are they doing? Nothing. In the real world. Building schools it, in uh, Ethiopia. With no, no but, disrespect but, to Ethiopia. But. but but for real, what 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 are they doing? What are they solving? How are they improving the order of the universe? All doing Christian? the same thing, basically. I, 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 I don't see it. And, and the funniest of this all is that Bitcoin doesn't even have a marketing department. It's just... A decentralized network and everyone started building a community around it yeah okay there are no updates from the bitcoin team and still everyone is trading it uh, yeah it's you guys think cool. there's something cool about the fact like does it make you more bullish that nobody fucking knows what quant is and yes. what it's doing like is there something about that that's obviously frustrating where it's like hey guys we're over here we've solved it but there's also this element of like Maybe there's something to that. Like there's there's the reason that people don't get it. It's hard to understand and that we're here at the right, like, do you know what I mean? Like there's this, it, there's this timing thing where it's like, there's enough evidence, but still nobody knows about it. And it's like this beautiful opportunity. Yeah. 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 I, I feel that way. Yeah. And that's also because of the people who are in the community. It smart. aren't the chance. There are really, really smart and talented people in this community. And they probably know what they're doing. And I always have this imposter syndrome. Like, am I the one being yeah. wrong? Yeah. But honestly, when I look at my peers, then I'm like, okay, those are also smart and talented people. So we might be right, actually. Because they see the same thing as what I do. And that's This would be a hell of a call, huh? I mean, if you zoom, if you fast forward 20 years, right, and all our kids are grown up and, you know, we're, we're grandparents and we're, we're doing whatever, we have a whole other life. For, and it's like, we, if we actually got it right, if we yeah. chose the number 80 out of, 100, out of thousands of projects, we just chose that one, we, we were able to isolate. I mean, think about how small crypto is anyway compared to like everything that's going on. Like we're so involved that we're like, oh, crypt crypto itself and Bitcoin, like that's a given. It's not a given for most people. 99% of people, literally you walk down the street, they don't know fucking shit. Like wow. they, they've heard of Bitcoin. They maybe heard of Ethereum. Do they own any? 
Probably not. Maybe right. coin coin flip if they even own any. But could they tell you what proof of work is? Could they tell you what mining is? Absolutely not. They bought it. Probability. Forget. And then yeah. we went so far down the rabbit hole. Yeah. We not only do we know what interoperability is, but we passed over the polka dots and the cosmos and the chain links, and we found the one that's actually doing all the things that has hard evidence that you're seeing papers come out from. Like we found the one. And like, we think we did anyway, we're pretty sure. But imagine if we're actually right. If we're actually, how epic of a call that it is. And like through all the bullshit and the billions of people on earth and the all the hundreds and thousands of projects that we could have been exposed to. And we were able to isolate this and go all in, quote unquote, on this project. Um, that, yeah, I mean, the, to, to be right, it's gonna be pretty freaking epic, I will say. Yeah. And Books so will being be wrong. Written. Being wrong will be more epic, probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not in the in a good way, but yeah. Well, that's a club we show with two dangling persons on the rope. <laughs> yeah. It will be your final episodes, I guess. Yeah, a happens. live stream. Oh, Otherwise, God. it's not going to get online. <laughs> Gil- Gilbert Ruggs. Jesus. Yeah. I mean, it, it feels like buying those technology questions. stocks. Th- those were the questions. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but uh, hold on, then. Because you said Gilbert Ruggs, there was. We are getting question. those weird questions. I saw someone commented on a tweet of mine today, how you know it's that's the whole new thing is they're dumping on the team. Gilbert's full of shit. He's a nobody. What if the token gets swapped out? I mean, I do not understand where the thinking comes from to begin with. Because somebody asked, what if they decide to just replace this token with another token? You know, what will happen is Quant will get shut down by every regulatory body because all they did was fund their company from people and then just like disappear. Like there's no utility in the token. Then you just illegal. That's illegal. Like no. they're not trying to do that. Like, like, okay. Could they yeah. increase the supply? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure it's technically possible. Like yeah, exactly. literally, like that's, from a tech de- technical perspective, that's the answer. Uh, yeah, could they move? Could they fuck with the tokenomics? Like, possibly, but that would also dilute. I don't think they can just print tokens and just give it to themselves. Like, I don't think that's legal. Like, like I think that has to be spelled out, and there would be like class action lawsuits up the ass, especially if this technology is at scale. You know what I mean? So, and I just think, I-, I just think there's there's not enough like reason or like the risk reward profile, they're going to be so filthy rich. It's like, now you're going to risk it all. Doesn't make sense to me. No. The question is indeed why. Mm. And uh, it's, it's obviously <clears throat> hard to answer to somebody that potentially doesn't know the project, doesn't know the scope, doesn't know um, the attention. I mean, if you look at it with Shiba Inu eyes or with Safer Moon eyes, um, potentially, you could say, okay, what if the token um, gets rock pulled? I think that is the thing, right? Because we, as a community, always, and we all do it ourselves, we always look for the things that could go wrong. And we have debunked so much FUD over the years. In the beginning, it was hard. That was the first wave, right? Of uh, the Jeffs and, and the SEC and all those people. And they, they debunked the f- initial foot because, well, there wasn't that much evidence. Now, we have a lot more evidence, right? We, we know so much. So the only foot that is left is the type of foot like, what if a meteor hits the Earth? What will happen to the economy? Solar flare! That, that's the kind of foot we have left. Like, yeah, sure. Well, yeah. I mean, it, it, it gets so unrealistic at some point. If that's your foot, you, you should rather not invest. Because all those other things have been debunked at this point, right? So it's now just stupid but The one fun. thing that people say that is like, they, they'll be like, um, if Overledger is live and really has all of these partners, then why is the token utility like not apparent? Like, yeah. I struggle with that as well, to be honest. But I it just is. Don't think, well, I, think. I just don't think that it's rolled out. Like, I think that... Um, I, just because it's in Oracle's like system and they're going to be using it, I don't think like out of the 400,000 clients, I don't think they're using Overledger. I think like 10 of them are. And yeah, they're, like, yeah, obviously. And they're like learning like test cases and stuff. Yeah, and yeah. 
And I think like blockchain is not live. And I think like SIA is, I don't think any central banks are doing cross-border payments through digital, through distributed ledgers yet. Like, But Gilbert testified that SIA is live and transacting and that they are paying and that they are using Overledger. Yeah, I'm sure they are on some like small test cases and they're like in like Italy or something. But like, do we think that this is at scale? Like not at all. Um, I don't know. That's how I feel. I just think like, I don't think we're at, we're anywhere near the volume that will translate to utility. I think it, the price is all speculative still. But I think we do see the utility already. I tend to believe Hungarian story about Coinbase custody. It's, it's, it's so weird. Why would one place buy up all these tokens and do nothing with it? It's very plausible that we are already witnessing the first instances uh, oh. of a treasury. I wouldn't be surprised. I, I would literally not be surprised if that's the case. Yeah, and, 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 and that they're using Coinbase custody now. So they have like the insurance and the paper trail. Instead of but it's all speculation wallets. at the end of the day. We don't know. And that's also the beauty of it, uh, I think, at least. Makes it it's a interesting. Bit more I mean, yeah. it just it just reminds me that I really don't know anything. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. we can study, like, the tech and we can study the partnerships. When it comes to the utility, I think we're all pretty much in the dark still. That's the reality. And that's, that's also a compliment to, yeah. to Quant Network. I mean... They're literally the best kept secret in God knows how, how big. I mean, crypto in all of in all of tech for sure. Yeah. yeah, and even the fact that people like Raul Paul even mention it, right? So out of all these projects, that they, they still address it and say, "Hey, this is valuable." That, I don't know. A lot of important people in the space see it, and I trust them more than most than the market, which just consists of moon boys. When Bitboy following shill. hype, when yeah. Bitboy shill. <laughs> I think Yarno has lost his voice over the last two and a half hours. I uh, see again. Greg zoning out too, needing lunch. I'm, I guess. I'm, Where are you? <laughs> I'm chilling. Uh, I haven't Good eaten. Chilling. I haven't eaten today at all, actually. Oh, so, okay. Yeah, but that's what and I we, do. I, I and we will see each other uh, for the listeners later today. Mm-hmm. So that's we'll be back uh, that's on great. the uh, the Q and A on Twitter. Hope to see yeah. all you guys there. Do you know what time you guys usually release this? Because we're I think we're getting on Twitter pretty early. Well, I guess for us it'll be early. I guess you guys will still have all day. Six, six and a half hours from now usually. Yeah. So we do it at least. Yeah, we we do it like in the early morning for Europeans, uh, so that it just gets on all the platforms. And if you go okay. in transit, you go to work. So it's you're my still intention. not retired. Got it. No, but then you can just uh, tune in and listen immediately. Yes, yeah, so if but, you all yeah. are listening, we're going to be online at 18.30 UTC will be Twitter Spaces if you didn't miss it. And if you did miss it, uh, there will be a recording on Twitter Spaces and I'm sure we'll post it in the Telegram yeah. and everything else. So. And I think at that time, we will cover most of the globe. I think for Australians, it's going to be a bit early. <laughs> it's a very early Saturday morning or you must be going out in the get wasted uh, being a very late night (laughs) a very very late night perhaps yeah so i think we cover most of the globe which is great um yeah i've noticed that i i post so what i do i don't know if you guys have noticed this but to measure who's awake Mm -hmm. i basically it shows you how many people are online in the telegram channels at any given moment so i keep a pretty close eye on that and um so i've that's when i post my tweets um, my daily tweet is usually between 6 and 8 a.m. my time, mm-hmm. which is, I guess, for you guys between uh, something like 2 and 4 p.m. or uh, I guess 14 and 1600, something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if that's 100%. That's what I've noticed is that that we usually have in the Quanti Lounge, we usually have anytime it's over 500. And honestly, the past couple of days, I think there's something about um, the conference that got people online. The past couple of days, we've had more people getting on like into the mid 500s in the Quanti Lounge at, at the peak. Um, I haven't kept this as close an eye on the community channel, but I think we usually get into the 800s that are online. Um, I'm not sure exactly how that translates like platform to platform number wise, but I think just it's a general gist of like who's awake at what time in terms of 
putting out content or like where our community lies. I think it makes a lot of sense that it would be around 8 a.m. Pacific because that means all of the United States is now awake and all of you know Europe is now in the afternoon and evening. Um, and so we're all up. So there yeah. you go, like right at that time when everyone's awake. And, um, so just a tidbit to anyone posting content, you know, yeah. it might be around that time. I, I do it as well. Opening times. Yeah, I always <laughs> look at the time zones and I also look at the moment that people in Australia are usually still awake and that you guys on the West Coast are also uh, waking up. That's the moment. That's I a good usually. question. I wonder uh, what the time is in Australia at that time that I post. I wonder if that has anything to do with it. It's very late, it's usually around 10 or 11 in the evening when I post. So I just always make sure that everyone is kind of awake or very early or so I know that the, most of the world is awake at that time, and it's usually right. somewhere here in the afternoon. You're right. If that's 10 o'clock at night in Australia, that's about 6 a.m. where I'm at, which is about 1,500 where you guys are at. Yeah, exactly. So that's the moment I post usually. That's the time I post. So there you go. Yeah, same here. I always try to post at that time. But Sorry, now, Australia. Now you, you guys need night. to actually reconsider this, because if everybody does this math, then the the feed of everybody will be most full at 1500 our time. So mm -hmm. you might want to consider getting a little bit later or a little bit earlier. So you're going to get on top of the feed or. Good thing is it only takes about one second to read a tweet and then you're on to mine. So yeah, that's true. And then I capture all of your time because I put out a way too long thread. So. <laughs> no, yeah. we, we just do the grumpy show early more early morning European time. So that my, I mean, it's a European show usually, Quant. There are a lot of Europeans in for some reason. A lot majority. of Dutchies. And uh, yeah, the majority is European for I some reason. That's true, yeah. So we just do it very early or time, and then the rest of the world can catch up. And also, we promise it on Friday. So then we must do it at that time so that Australians still have it on Friday and that people in the US also get it very somewhere at night. <laughs> ah. Thursday night. I don't know. Are we through? I think we are. Are we satisfied? I'm saturated for sure. Saturated. That's the word. Greg. It's a blast. Yeah. Really loved having you. I um, think it was a really interesting uh, conversation. I know from, from our prep uh, chat that we had um, that you were kind of don't know if it's the right word, apprehensive about the, the, the loose um, the loose style we have, the very little preparation. How did you feel? I felt great. No, I wasn't uh, apprehensive. It was more just um, interested in, because uh, I, the way I approach my rooms and things that I do live are like mm -hmm. very, very organized like overly organized for most people and you guys have the complete opposite where it's like hey we show up we kick it we pick a few things to talk about and then we do long form and we just we vibe out um it's probably easier maybe to do that because you have a partner so you guys can kind of bounce off each other where for me it's like i don't want to be like umming and anding and what should i do next thing because i can't pass it off to anyone else so it's probably just somewhere in the middle of that but yeah no i was actually extremely excited for this because i knew I know how like laid back you guys are and how chill and um, yeah, I, I had a really good time. So I appreciate you bringing me on. I'm, I'm, we'd love to come on in the future again and we do another check-in at some point. Love it. Hey, nice. Thank you so much, man. Thanks yeah, so much. absolutely. Keep up the good work. You guys are killing it. You too. And uh, yeah, really looking forward to, uh, forward to tomorrow also. Today. 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 Yeah, that's yeah. right. <laughs> I, fell, I fell for it again. I need to get to bed. Yes, you um, do. Viewers, listeners, thank you so much uh, for being here, sitting this one out over two and a half hours. Um, really appreciate you guys being here. Make sure to uh, do the like and the subscribe and the comments. Um, make sure to engage with uh, with Greg and his uh, and his tweets. Follow him at Greg Lund, twenty seven. Yeah, got it. On uh, on Twitter and uh, show up at the yeah, Twitter Spaces today. tonight. Yeah. And then we'll uh, we'll see you next week. Okay. Stay comfy. Stay comfy. Cheers. <laughs>